Hey, everybody. Look, it's me and Jakir. Hi, Jakir. How are you? Hi, Andrew. Thanks for being Good here. I, friend. I normally start with just me on the screen, and I've realized, because I'm putting these together for podcasts, I say the exact same thing every week, and it was driving me nuts. So I decided just to start right in like that. So thanks so much for being here. This is going to be awesome. Now, I just want to tell everybody, Jakir has a little time limit. So we're already sort of planning on a part one, part two thing, depending on how we, we get through stuff. Because I have a feeling, knowing me, we're going to talk a lot, because that's what we do. So um, you're joining us from your studio just outside Nashville. Is this correct? Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, down in Franklin. So it's about a 20 minute drive south of Nashville. And it's Franklin and Nashville almost connected at this point. They grow yeah, into you each know, other. In a typical sort of like suburban sprawl way. Yeah. Right. Right. Are you around other a lot of other people with studios? Like I know where Vance is, there are tons of people right around him and or are you kind of out uh, on your own? No, well, as it turns out, there are two studios on my street. It's just a, it's a residential street. Then there are houses. Um, there's a couple down at the other end of the block, you know, but it's it's not really, uh, yeah, it's not really a, a community like Berry Hill, like where Vance is. Right, right. You know, Blackbird and stuff. I, I, I moved away from that, from Blackbird to come down here about five years ago. Right. Excellent. Well, we'll get to that. But that's pretty recent. So we've yeah. got to go all the way in the Wayback Machine because as I love to do with these, I love to find out like what got you into making records. So the first thing is I got it. We have to talk about the fact that at five, your first two 45s you bought or got or were given ABC by the Jackson 5 and Fly Like an Eagle, Steve Miller Band. That's a pretty good way to start in terms of like, studying music and records did you choose those or how did that happen yeah they were def they were they were my requests yeah um i had a little close and play 45 um and i, I mean i don't remember i don't remember the the transaction or the moment but i i know that i asked for those records um having heard, heard them on the radio and those were the those were the two records that i uh, uh that I really desired to have. My mom had a fabulous uh, LP collection, um, but I kind of wanted to have my own little, my own little thing going on. That's awesome, and I loved those Motown forty fives with a little map of Detroit on the top and the rainbow Motown and everything. Absolutely. So good, so good. Do you still have those forty fives? I wish I did. No, yeah. I don't. I think we all wish we did. Stacks yeah. of them. So did um, did anyone in your your family play musical instruments or was involved in the music industry at all, even slightly? Uh, my mom would probably be the, like, in addition to her amazing uh, album collection, she played a little bit of piano. So we had a piano in the, in the house. So the room, I guess, I guess we'd call it the family room uh, or the living room. No, it would be the living room because it was a formal room. Um, it, uh, there was a, the hi-fi in there with the, the albums and then, uh, the piano so i would spend a lot of time in there and i i, I loved uh, especially when i was smaller um kind of hanging out underneath the piano that was kind of like my you know, <laughs> you know when you're small you kind of like to go into these little smaller yeah. spaces uh, that was sort of my zone and listen to the listen to the records and stuff and i also i also pretty early on not long after i had that um close and play 45 um i got a uh one of those cassette decks with the buttons on the end Oh yeah, uh, that uh, uh, that was kind of. I listened to a lot of, um, cass you know, music on cassette. Not long after that, uh, and um, and uh, like uh, books on tape. I remember, I remember like uh, like Uncle Remus stories and just different, just different children's stories that I had on tape that I right. would listen to a lot. Wow. And then I, 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 at a certain point when I got tired of listening to those and I didn't have fresh cassettes to record on, I erased over many of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When you find out you can put that little bit of scotch tape over the hole. Mm -hmm. uh, amazing. So at what point did you start realizing like that making records was a, a thing? Uh, I sort of, well, I, I sort of became, I sort of began to have a consciousness about it when I was in my early teens. Cause I realized, I sort of realized that at that point that there, and it was from listening to Jimi Hendrix records 
you know, I guess the things that um, Eddie Kramer was doing and, and, you know, to sort of facilitate Jimmy's, you know, artistic desires and, and just the studio wizardry of the day, that there was a manipulation going on. It wasn't just, I mean, you know, that was going on obviously with produced records, but it, I wasn't really aware of it. it right. The Jimi Hendrix records that sort of the light bulb kind of went off and I could, it's like, well, how are they doing like that reverse stuff? And why, it, you know, like third stone from the sun, how is it, that, how is that voice so low and, you know, syrupy sounding? Um, and I just became aware that the the studio was a, a, a process, like record making was a process. Um, and then in my later teens started to look into it a little bit more. Right. And were you, you were playing guitar at this point? Cause I, mm, we had, uh, we had yeah, a very, I, I I started out like I wanted to be a drummer when I was really, really young. My parents gave me an acoustic guitar instead. Yeah. Um, I was never very, you know, I just was never very, uh, very into the acoustic guitar because I, everything I listened to was like electric guitar. And, um, and, uh, and then in bass, I started playing high, uh, in, in high school, I started playing bass. Um, and then as I, I think after I graduated from high school, I got a guitar again. Right. An electric guitar. I got a Gibson Les Paul. So in, in, in high school and, you know, junior high age and high school, I basically just had a, I was a bass player, I guess you would say. Right. And you're playing in bands or just doing a little bit stuff. off and on, off and on. I've never really had, we never really had a formalized band. It was like, we'd get together and mess around and talk about having a band and sort of think we had a band for a week or two, but we never had any gigs or anything like that. <laughs> I actually didn't play a gig. I wasn't on stage playing a gig until I actually had my first studio job. When I'd gone back to playing guitar, um, I made a, uh, a record for a local Washington DC band and they needed a rhythm guitar player to basically play the songs the way we'd made the record or the recordings. Right. And so I became a rhythm guitar player and, in a band um for about a month <laughs> <laughs> and that was enough <laughs> yeah it was yeah i mean i don't remember why why i didn't follow through with it but that's you know it's like i've never been a very disciplined musician i my music my interest in musicality and stuff always i always kind of gravitated back towards you know the gear and the environment and helping other people do it right as, a, so, as opposed to me being involved in it how did you start actually recording i mean because you did the um the recording workshop in ohio right that six week yeah. program but yeah. that was so what was just what was the journey to actually say like okay i'm gonna learn how to do this and, and go and figure that out well uh you know so all these things are going on in my life uh in and around bands, sort of playing music, interested in loving music, interested in the record making process, aware, aware of it. Um, and I went away to college and I didn't really want to be there. So I dropped out and it caused a lot of friction between my dad and I. Um, and so I came home and uh, ended up came home, but not being allowed to be at home. So I kind of was on my own for a while and I had a furniture moving job, which, you know, which was fine, uh, which was fine. But I, I sort of realized that that in that it's just like, well, you don't want to go to school. You don't want to have a traditional education. You want to follow a traditional path. I don't want to wear a suit and go to, to an office. So like, what the fuck am I going to do? And it's like, I'm thinking about, you know, my interests and, and I saw an ad in the back of Rolling Stone magazine for the recording workshop and it's like okay well this thing that i'm aware of that i'm curious about and and love music uh, and i had some confidence in recording because when i was young i wanted to be a dj so i i would i would take that cassette player that i already mentioned and i re would record my mom's albums um in the in the room so you know i had a kind of an idea of like how to capture something how to sequence something because I would change, you know, I'd play once I'd record one song, stop the whole operation and then start another one, record it. And then I'd make little DJ announcements. So anyways, back to. Well, no, no, workshop. we can, we can spend more time on the DJ announcements. Like what's a typical DJ announcement from the young Jakir King. Oh gosh. I was just imitating what I was hearing on the, on the, 
on the uh, the radio really i've just announced the songs that i was going to play and i'd i you know i'd talk about whatever you know the weather and just <laughs> like dj things and i probably you know and i i would do little commercials but too, did you did you have a station id you must have no really i wasn't that no sorry man my imagination Damn. didn't take me that far all right all right fair enough <laughs> 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 that was you know that was on that was on the little cart button that was something else. i didn't have to do that oh right yeah 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 okay that's fair enough <laughs> that did, did you have can. a different dj name no no all no. right you were just straight up just playing records yeah pretty much cool <laughs> i was trying to be the cool dj you know just, right right just, you know just curating a vibe i guess right no no wolfman jack or anything like that just uh, uh, actually well no uh, no, nothing like that. I did experiment with the Wolfman personality. I do remember now, <laughs> but, uh, I, you know, I, I've always, uh, I don't know, I guess I'm, I'm pretty shy, man. And it's like, I, I am not like a very, I'm happy to talk, but I'm, it's difficult for me to just make small talk. You know, it's just like, right. I'm very much about things, having conversations that feel like that there is some importance or like that I actually care about what we're talking about or it's like something i think about i I, i'm just not very good at making just talking about whatever just to fill the space this isn't gonna go well then (laughs) (laughs) oh i think Uh, i don't think that i don't think that i wouldn't characterize you as that person um (laughs) but it's just like it's my personality i think you know why what i love about your personality is you're just so at ease you can relate to everybody and no, you're but e- small talk e- terrifies e- me. Subjects and talk talk freely about them. You have a very you have a very quick wit, and you know, quick sensibility about saying things that are funny or intelligent. You know. Yeah, I don't know because I I am absolutely terrified of small talk too. Though I hate it. Like if we go somewhere, and there are a bunch of people I don't know. Which of course th- I'm talking about pre pandemic because fortunately that never comes up now. But right. like I would make Debbie go like strike up a conversation. <laughs> And then report back to me. <laughs> Will I be able to survive at that table? So, no, I know exactly what you mean. Exactly what you mean. So, okay, we can get off the, the DJ thing and get on to the, the recording school thing. Um, yeah, so I just like, I, you, it's like, well, what am I going to do? With, what am I going to do with my life? And it's like, well, that seems pretty, you know, that seems pretty interesting because I like, I like tinkering with stuff. I like, I like things like machines and gear and, and all that sort of stuff sort of thing. And um, I was like, well, you just give it a, why not give it a try? So I continued on my uh, furniture moving job until I'd saved enough funds to pay for it and go. And my mom, my mom let me borrow her car wow. to drive up there. And um, cause she, she wasn't in need of it uh, at that particular time. Uh, so I got to borrow her car for six weeks and I went up and yeah, I did that, did that thing. And how was it? Like, what, what was the deal with it? Was it? It's, it, it's an, I think, I mean, it's a still an ongoing program. And I think it's a really, I think it's a really great program because it teaches you the basics, the nuts and the bolts, you know, uh, you know, when I went, it's still structured the same, basically. Uh, when I went, it was the, the core program was five weeks and it's, I was intimidated when I was, when I got there and they showed, they, toward the school and we, I went into studio a, um, I was, I was like, it was like walking into the cockpit of a spaceship or an airplane. It's like, Oh my God. You know, it's like, how am I going to ever figure out how to do all that? Uh, I was pretty, I was kind of intimidated at first, but then, uh, you, you kind of get the hang of it. I mean, the school is awesome. It, you are in class Monday through Friday. They give you stuff you need to do over the weekend. You're, in lectures and, and instruction five or six hours a day. And then you have four or five hours of kind of lab in the studio work of different assignments. And they are just pouring the information because in five weeks, yeah, it's the pace of it's really intense. And you, you know, you could see after a few days a week, it's like, you know, who's, who's like already getting left behind who who is already second having second thoughts about the whole thing um so in a way it's like a great initiation it's like you either it's you keep up or you don't right um and so that was five weeks it was really fun i think i remember the test that we had to do they timed us on how quickly we could get 
um, a microphone. The microphone was set up. We didn't have to set it up, but we set it up as a group. But then you came into the control room and then uh, everybody, there was like, we were like a group of five. And then, so the other four students would go in this large vocal booth. So they couldn't watch the test. Um, and the instructor would time you they, we had a radio out in the studio for, for the, as a source for the, for the sound, the microphone, and they would time you um, making, making the patch, you know, and making all the assignments on the desk and getting the gain right and, you know, and getting it assigned to the quarter inch tape machine. Right. You know, and uh, I, I remember that being, I felt after I was successful with that test, I felt like, okay, I kind of calmed down a little bit. I think I was like, I can, I can get this. And I think the following week we had to do voiceover edits right. on the quarter inch machine and music. And we had to take, I think the assignment was something like take a, you know, a minute long, you know, commercial, like voiceover music piece and get it down to 15 seconds. Um, and I was like, and you know, it's not, <laughs> A terror, you know, they, of course they showed us how to do it, but they don't really explain the concept of it. And, you know, and I got it, I got it right the first time. And so just those little things gave me confidence and I kind of calmed down. Right. Um, and really got, really got into it. And then, so then the, so it's, a, I guess it was there for six, seven weeks, the, there's a five week program and then there's a maintenance program that you could take that was optional. Right. Um, and that would immediately follow the five week course and that the maintenance at that time was really just about more time learning how to, uh, uh, basically align tape machines right? and how to, tr and how to troubleshoot in the studio, uh, and just get a little bit deeper on the sort of like the nuts and bolts of how things, uh, happen and, and really understand, I mean, understanding an analog tape machine at that time in the, you know, seventies, eighties, even nineties was really important to being an assistant because, you know, that was, yeah, that's where everything happened and you had to be really knowledgeable about it. So I did the, so I did the maintenance thing for a week and then the top 10% of the class from the core, uh, five weeks could apply for the advanced week. Right. Um, and, and so I was, I was able to stay and do that. And that was cool because then we got to go up to the more private studio that was up on top of the hill um, where all of the, you know, where all the, not real gear, but where the engineers that taught us um, would, that's where they would do their work, you know, their, their real work. Um, so it was, you know, it was cool to get to do that. And I, for, and we had a local, local band came in. That was the other part about the advanced course is that a local band came in and we got to actually record them as opposed to recording each other in these sort of prepared, um, assignments at, right. that were in the five week course. Right. And was there anybody teaching there, like in particular who sort of became a mentor or was, it was just a blitz and then out? Yeah. Blitz and out. Right. Blitz and out. But you know, at the time Paisley park was being built. Right. Um, or it had, it was new, I guess it was new and they were expanding. And, uh, you know, a couple of the engineers were in the running for gigs up there. Um, I don't remember, I don't remember his name, but he was, he was a super funny guy. I think it might've been Scott. Um, but, uh, soon after I graduated, uh, I, I heard that he had gotten a gig up there and moved, moved up there. So it was, you know, it was cool. You felt like, okay, you I've been around some like real, real cats doing this and, and learn something. And, um, and then, you know, and also at the time MIDI was kind of a new, right. new thing in the, in the, the late eighties. Uh, so we, we kind of talked about it, but it was, it was really just sort of like, Hey, this, this technology is coming and here's a little, here's a little bit of information on it and enough to kind of get you going. Right. Cause yeah, I mean the, the M1 came out in what, 85, 84, Something, like, Something that. like that. Yeah. yeah. So it was it was the early yeah, just getting past where every company had their own way for things to talk to each other, like the DMX system, the Oberheim one and right. all that stuff. And so were like, you were you drawn to that? Were you like, man, I am a geek and I am gonna learn all of this? Um, you know, uh yeah, a little bit. It, it my my time with samplers and sequencers and all that stuff was a little bit delayed. I did not at first. Um, 
I was mostly, you know, interested in just sort of the traditional aspect of, of the recording as opposed to the sequencers and stuff that probably came, um, uh, around 1990, 91. So it was a little bit, a couple of years later than that when I got started. Right. Cause, cause they didn't really have a lot of it at the school. I mean, there was a little bit, but they didn't, it wasn't like a, a system you could get really deep in and, and they hadn't yet really put that, uh, in the curriculum very heavy. Um, and then the studio, the first year they got my, that my first job at, they just had a little bit of it as well, but they, but they did have one thing that was very interesting, uh, was, a the Yamaha DMP seven digital mixer. Oh yeah. Which did use the, which did use the MIDI, which was a very, which was a very cool thing. Um, I forget what the I forget what the reason was that the studio had it, but I, I that that piece in particular was the the thing that made me see like oh I, this MIDI stuff maybe is more useful to me than I think right now. Right. And so how did you get that first gig? What because it was in uh, was it in Baltimore? Um, uh, uh, Bethesda, Maryland. Bethesda, right? Bethesda, Maryland. Well, so- you know going to school then they did, there wasn't um, placement programs or anything like that. They just gave you a little bit of advice about how to prepare a resume, how to knock on doors, give you a little bit of idea about where you should go look for jobs um, and just sort of prepare you for what the expectation would be. Um, so I went, I, you know, when I got home, I basically uh, opened up the newspaper. I looked in the newspaper and the help wanted ads and I opened up the phone book and I called every comp every sort of business that you know studio recording studios television stations radio stations everything that i could think of that you know that might have an opportunity to do audio work in right um and uh balance sound um just happened to have an opening for an assistant engineer at the time when i when i was inquiring and um because one of the engineers had gone to a a studio in Virginia. I think it was called Bias. Right. Um, and there was some API guys there as well. I think, I think Bias had some, Bias Studios had some relationship with API back in the day. Right. So, um, and did you ever think of going anywhere else at that point or you knew you were going to go back home and just kind of feel your way through? Uh, when I, when I left the school, you mean? Yeah. Uh, no, I had, I had not, I hadn't really thought beyond just going home. Right. And so while home, open up that phone book and just see what's happened. Like, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, is like I had exhausted all my savings. I had saved enough money to get myself through the school and back home. Um, right. But, uh, you know, I didn't have my own car. I had get my car, my mom's car back to her. And um, yeah, it was just like my next thing was like, okay, well, now I've got to try and see if I can find a job in this in this field. Right. And I think it took about a month and I lucked into that job. And what kind of stuff were they doing at balance? Um, most, well, the majority of it was, um, music for television and film voiceover work, like local ad work, right. Commercial type of commercial type of stuff, you know, but fortunately in the day it it wasn't, uh, just in terms of recording experience, we would have like ensembles of musicians come in or, like strings or horns or stuff. It was like still really traditional types of com- composition and uh, arrangement recording stuff for these, for the ads. So they did, there was a lot of that during the day because obviously that's where there's good money in that for yeah. a studio. And then in, at nighttime, we would have uh, local projects, um, go-go music, something that kind of started in the DC area. Right. So is it Charles Brown? Um and I can't, I'm drawing a blank on, is it Chuck Brown? And I'd have to look, I'd have to look it up, but, but go-go music was kind of a thing. So we would do some local, uh, the, uh, local go-go music. Um, there was this really cool uh, artist. His name was Osiris. He was kind of like a, um, sort of a, like Isaac Hayes, Stevie Wonder type of wow. soulful artist, you know, and um, amazing voice. And that band was so funky, man. I just remember those guys were so funky. Uh, it was so cool. So we do things like that at night or local bands like that. I mentioned the, the band that I 
played rhythm guitar in for a second. They would just throw me on the nighttime cheap sessions as the lead engineer. Right. Great. It, because the guys had worked all day and they went, they went home. So uh, I would work, sometimes I would work all day and all night to do, to do both. But I was, I was into it because I was, I was learning and experimenting, especially I, I get to observe what was going on during the day and learn how to edit tape. I had, had to do a lot of quarter inch edits for voiceover tapes. Right. Uh, and uh, you have to make duplicate reels and safeties and do the 15 second edits and then make multiple copies. So it could be distributed to radio stations and, or, you know, off to duplication, whatever, whatever the thing was. And then, so you, you know, you have all this very sort of structured stuff you've got to do during the day. And then, it, which involved music, but then at night it's just like, okay, well, they just turn you loose in the studio and just do whatever and uh, make, make mistakes and figure it out. And did you get to work with any one in particular during all that? I mean, or was it just stuff coming in and out? Just stuff coming in and out. I remember one, I, I, I wish I could remember. I'm terrible with like names from a long time ago. Um, but I remember a project came in, they booked the studio for a week solid. So it was like day and night. It was a kind of a rock project, female lead vocalist. I would compare it to sort of like a Pat Benatar type of thing. She was right. really like a really strong, powerful, cool vocalist, rock band kind of vibe. And they were there for a week. Um, they had somebody, they weren't on a label, but they had, they were really good and they had somebody paying for it. And he'd hired this engineer that came down from New York. And this guy had been working for a young Rick Rubin at the time. Right. And this guy really had, he really had serious chops and it was really amazing to see this guy come in from New York and just kind of like make this, like this live rock band, get it on tape and, and how he, I learned like how he was managing his track count. And then when it came to doing um, the vocals, um, he just, he let her sing a couple takes, you know, cause so we, I think we were working with six or seven tracks left. Like he did the base, he did the basic recording and then he moved on to vocals, so he still had the real estate on the 24 track. He do he did a couple takes, just let her do her thing, and then he'd say, you know, you know, I want one thing where you sound really pissed off. You know, he'd kind of like coach her up on some different emotions, and then so it'd be a couple of those, and then then like with the last pass, there was like a couple specific things that he asked for in the performance. Didn't really give any vibe instructions, just like, you know we need this one particular moment in this way, I think. Right. Do that. And then, the, and then, you know, then he watched him make the notes on it. And then the way that, and then the way he set the desk up and level Matt, like he would figure out which parts, like which lines he was going to comp to, to another track and he'd rebalance it, you know, he'd rebalance right. to, and punch it all together. And it's like, I was like, man, what a fucking education that was. And he was so confident and cocky. Right. Um, and good that it was just like, wow, this is like, this is awesome. Um, and then he got that, then he got that done. He got the comp comp done. And then he just over, he put overdubs over the top of the, right. You know, the source tracks as you did, as you did. And it was just like, bang, it's done. And then, and then, uh, at the end of the week, he made these like super fast, awesome rough mixes. And he was just like out of there. It's just like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> You know, but I learned, I, I just learned, I learned a ton, you know, just because he was so bold and like assertive and like had this method, he had this method to get stuff done. And he was, yeah, it just, it was really impressive. And this kind of let, obviously you can kind of tell from, it, it really left an impression on me. Yeah. Well, it's, it's like a lot of the people I've talked to worked at studios that were doing jingles and things like that during the day. And it's that the method and the having to be so fast and not make mistakes but it's got to be great and then to have that kind of mentality on a record project that's a little bit different so it must have been quite cool to see somebody working like that at that speed with that method but applying yeah, it, it to a record it was it was super, it was really super super yeah one story i like to tell about the the daytime stuff that is um uh, in doing vocal edits one day, I, I took the, um, I took the wrong cue 
and I cut in the wrong, uh, I cut in the wrong take for, for, a, I think it was a, I think it was a car commercial for like a deal, like a local dealership, um, you know, and sent, sent everything out. So it was a morning session. I got everything out in the afternoon. The, I guess the guy that the advertising agent guy checked the tapes that had been sent to his office and he came down to the studio. It was like storming mad. And I, cause I, I didn't put in the thing that he'd asked for. Oh boy. And uh, I'd thrown all the outtakes away already, you know, cause it's just all, you know, it's just like, we're not going to read the tapes all cut up. You're not yeah, going to exactly. reuse just that Just little stuff. bits of tape in the trash. Yeah. And I, so I, sp- I had to spend like two hours. Uh, well, I had to dig up, I had to dig it all out of the dumpster. <laughs> God. And then spend two hours taping pieces of tape back together, like looking for the, the you know, because you mark, you mark, you kind of can tell because you have to mark with, with the, with the uh, mark, you have to mark the tape about what takes or what, yeah. you know, it's just like you listen, okay, mark this, this is, and then you get to it so that you can identify what they, what you want to assemble. And uh, I eventually found it, but that was like a real lesson in organization too. Man. It's, you know, it's just just the trials of it, you know? And like I had a, in San Francisco, I worked at a place called Russian Hill and as an assistant engineer there, we were working to a DAW, like the voiceover talent, the engineer was recording to a DAW, but we had to make two safeties. Um, and one was a, one was a, a Panasonic, like 30, what are they? 3800s, 3600s, you remember those? Yeah. The DAT machines? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 3700. Well, so there's yeah. one of, there's a Panasonic and then there's a Sony. Well, you know, sometimes the voiceover takes go really fast or there's a false start and you have to re, you know, basically reslating it. The Sony, you could just jam the, the IDs into it. And, right. But then the Panasonic wouldn't accept IDs within 10 or the 10, yeah, exactly. 10 second window. Yep. Yep. So you're like, you know, you're like pushing these buttons and you got to, you got to be writing everything down because then you had to go back after the session and index properly index the panasonic it's just and you know you're getting you know it's just it's brutal. oh god yeah i remember that and it had the little renumber button on the bottom so then it would renumber yeah. them once they were there it's i mean and i think it's also a really good lesson because you'd think like man it's a fucking local car commercial who cares but they care they care a lot and well, sure. everything is as important as like you know the magnum opus of your life when you finally make your own record or whatever it is like that is what needs to happen and i think it's it's great to learn that early on it is yeah it's just like that it may it makes you understand that it's you're in a service business and the client you know you're being you're being paid to do a job and the client is the client yeah and it's you know so it was it was it was a good lesson it was a good lesson to how to be you know, organize and kind of watch out for your, you know, watch, watch out for, um, being able to recover from mistakes more easily. Right. So, but you were only there for about a year, right? That's right. And did yeah. you, did you realize at that point, like, okay, I got to get somewhere where they're making records. Cause that's what I want to do. Or did they say you've outgrown this place? Like what, what was that transition? Cause you got no, a lot of I help. I felt like that. I wanted to go somewhere else. Right. Yeah. Cause I'd had, you know, I had, over that course of the year, I'd had a lot of great opportunities and musicians coming in from out of town and like that engineer that I talked about. It's like, hmm, I mean, this is cool here and all, and there's cool things going on, but it seems like, you know, getting more into it. It's like, well, there's not that many of the records that I listen to or the things that are happening aren't really happening here. We're kind of, we're kind of doing, doing it over here on the side, you know, we're, right. we're kind of playing in a little puddle over here and I want to go swim in the ocean. And had you already decided that production was where you wanted to end up or you were still just absorbing the engineering and doing that? Yeah, I was just still absorbing the engineering. But, you know, the thing is, is like without really making a, uh, a conscious effort when, you know, when you get thrown on these sessions for these local bands, like the one that I, that I joined for a minute, it's, you end up being a producer because they come into the studio and they don't really know the ropes and, and they're, they're trying to get a bunch of stuff done quickly because you know, that the hours are limited. Everybody's going to get tired at, at two or three in the morning. Yeah. This is trying to work through it. So 
you end up sort of just speaking up and helping move things along. And, and then you, you start to feel confident to, to, you know, just have an opinion about things. So it's, I just sort of started doing it from the beginning without really that being my intention. Right. Uh, yeah, I was just really focused on learning the craft of engineering. Um, but I guess I never really, you know, I never really thought about it at that time as the jobs being so different. It's just, right. you know, that like, oh, the, the producer's job is this, this stuff. And I'm just an engineer or whatever. It's just like, I just, it's just like, let's just get it done. Right. I wasn't really... Because also early on, I wasn't really around producers. It's it's like the with that, that engineer that came in. He was also the producer, um, but I just kind of viewed him more as just the engineer because he was doing the job that I was doing. Right. You know, and he's running the gear, and that's that's what the engineer does. He was also the producer, but I didn't really think about it as like that's a separate role. Right. Yeah. I mean, you have to kind of have to go up a level in record budget to separate those roles. I mean, now mm -hmm. they're almost always the same person, but back then, right. you know, for label stuff, it was almost never the same person, but I guess, you know, as soon as you get into a more local scene, yeah, there wouldn't be producers coming in. Right. So, you know, and like right. Don, like Don Zentera, you know, had, uh, had, had his studio, um, uh, in, in Virginia. And it's like, you know, it's, guys like that doing um like discord records and all that kind of stuff uh it's just it's just a one-man operation right you know and, so it's like what's that well i was just gonna ask did you have any sort of feeling about what like, what kind of music you wanted to work on because it feels as though you didn't even really care you just wanted to work you just wanted to engineer but i could have that totally wrong no that's pretty that's pretty true i mean i was i i enjoyed it all i um I got put on this jazz session and I wasn't, ter I mean, I, of course it was familiar with a little bit with jazz, but I hadn't really started consuming it in the way that, uh, in my, you know, in my twenties that I, I really fell in love with like straight ahead jazz and got really deep into it. But, um, of course was familiar with Miles Davis and stuff like that, but I wasn't really, we didn't really have those records growing up. That wasn't really my mom's taste in music. So I wasn't that exposed to it. And, um, we had this, amazing jazz ensemble that came into the studio and they wanted to, they were from, they came down from New York. I don't know. I don't know how they ended up at, at our studio. They came down from New York and it was a live jazz session with a female vocalist. And it's just like, so I'm recording them live to live to two track with not having much reference of it. And it, and it turned out, I mean, they were happy. I had a good time. Wow. So it's just like, I'm, I'm just into it, whatever it is. Yeah. I was just wanted to work. I didn't really, of course I love rock and roll the most. Um, but that doesn't necessarily, just because you love a certain kind of music doesn't necessarily mean as a creator that that's maybe where your best output is, right. even though it's something you really love. It's, it's interesting to me how that works sometimes, especially in our, on our side of things. Um, yeah. Just like what, what sort of, what sort of manifests. I mean, I feel like probably the same as you, I could make anybody's record cause I love music and I love the process and I love the engagement. So it's the genre doesn't as much matter right. as long as I like, as long as I think that there's some, the music, like there's something individualistic to say that it's creative, there's talent um, uh, there's belief in it, you know, there's like things that you can attach to. I don't, you know, that's all I really, that's all I really need. I like the creative process more than, than what the genre is. Right. Right. So rather than like, cause I mean, obviously there was a pretty serious scene in DC at that point. I mean, Fugazi's still going strong and all that, but so, but you just needed to get somewhere where they're making records to like yeah. big time. Yeah. Right. Yeah, because I was already I mean because I was already in one of the best studios in the area. Right. So it's like, okay, well, this is and so um New York New York wasn't really didn't really feel I'm not really a city, like a big city kind of place like that type of person. Um and I I had visited New York a lot cuz I have family up there. And although I like it, it's not where I felt like I wanted to live. 
Um, Nashville, I didn't think was an option, oddly enough, at the you know at the time because I thought all it was was country music. Yeah, no, I was don't. exactly the same way. Yeah, it's like eh, and then it's just like well, L.A. You know, so I'll go out. I'll go out to California and check that out. And my studio, my studio manager at Balance Sound, about a month or two after I started my job there, we got a new studio manager uh, because John, who was the chief engineer when I was hired had been doing, had been running the studio as well. And I'm not sure what, how he fell into doing that, but he wasn't, he didn't want to do it. So we eventually, I guess they were on the lookout for a studio manager. So Steve came um, from California to manage the studio and he had come from the San Francisco Bay area. He had been like around the plant and fantasy and stuff like that. I forget this. Um, um, I guess he worked at the, I guess he did have a job at the plant, but Steve right. came uh, to manage the studio. And, you know, so he, we had worked together for maybe six or nine months. And I, and I sort of, we had become friends and I confided to him that I wanted to go elsewhere and look for a job. I was, I was going to go to LA. I asked for the time off so I could go to LA and he's like, okay, I'll give you the time off, but you have to, you have to promise me that you'll add San Francisco to your trip. Right. Because I, you know, I want to introduce you. I think you should go there. I think you might like it better. Um, I'll, and I can, you know, I can introduce you to some people. And I was, I was like, ah, okay. You know, I didn't really think that I wanted to to go to San Francisco. So I agreed to tack on three or four days at the end of my trip. Um, and uh, yeah, I went out to, went out to California. And I did not like L.A. I didn't. I didn't. It didn't really not because I didn't like the place so much, but it just, it was, it just felt really big to me. The drives were really far. Right. Um, the people I met in the studios weren't very, didn't seem very, they weren't very nice to me, you know? And it was just kind of like, I just don't really dig this vibe. Um, so after about three or four days of going to interviews and seeing studios, um, I just would go to the, I would go to the beach. I was staying at, with a, a friend's family who was kind enough to put me up. They lived in Pasadena. They had an extra bedroom. They lent me their car and they were so excited for me to be there job hunting. And, um, after three or four days, um, I just started lying to them, you know, <laughs> at the end of the day, I would take their car and I would drive to Venice beach or somewhere <laughs> and I'd hang out for the day and, you know, just waste, you know, just idle with my time and then go back. I just really wasn't interested in exploring. It's so funny that you didn't, oh, yeah, you didn't day, feel like you could day. tell them. <laughs> I love that. That's like, now I got to go hide on the beach. <laughs> exactly. It's like, this is not, this is not for me. And I just, you know, I just wasn't, I just didn't have the, not like now I wouldn't at all do that. I would speak up and, you know, change my plans, but. Well, I suppose that was, the time a, I was, it was a little not, bit of a weird time in LA too, because it was sort of in that musical transition period too, like late eighties. It's um, mm -hmm. kind of between scenes in a way. So I can see that being that's a, a That's a good something. point. I didn't, you know, when I was there, I didn't really, didn't really pick up on a scene that d didn't seem like there was anything that was very cohesive. And it's probably because of the transitional time. And also right. I didn't really get to know, I didn't really get to know the scene or know anybody. It's just, I didn't like the people that I was meeting at the studios. Right. And did you go to like all the usual suspects, just all the big ones? Mm -hmm. and, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The ones, well, not, not all of them. I didn't, I couldn't get appointments at all of them. Right. Yeah. You know? Like I didn't go, uh, I didn't, uh, I didn't manage to get into sunset sound. I mean, of course I drove past it and walked past it. And, right. Oh, you know, I looked, walked <laughs> past it and looked in the, you know, looked in the parking lot, but I never got inside. Yeah. And the studios are all so individual that, you know, it could have been if you'd gotten into sunset and like, Oh, it might've been the right place, but right. It is what it is. So it is what it is. Yeah. I mean, uh, so, and which is fine. So anyway, so I went to, um, so I, I, after my time at the beach, I went up to San Francisco, um, and got a, a job pretty quickly at a, at a studio called different fur mm -hmm. because the, I was replacing an assistant that had been, that had to be fired, um, for he, he was, uh, he was aligning the tape machine and it was a Bobby Brown master. Um, and 
you know, I th at that studio, they put the tones and the record pad at the head yeah. of the tape. That's just the stupidest yeah. thing ever in the history the of ever. And ever, it got right? so many assistants fired, man. Yep. Ugh. So he, he raced to like the first 15 seconds of a master. Yeah. You know, and uh, because just so everybody knows, it's like when you on a 24 track, when you have you have the you would put the the tones at the top at yeah. the head and then you'd have a 30 second record pad. So you'd align the machine and you have this little record pad to to align it. But the right after that was the, the master. Yeah. So I was used so to after, put like after a that, mile and I insisted a on always putting my tones and the record pad at the end. Absolutely. Like, and it, I'd rather just have the tape, I'd rather have the tape, I have to rethread the tape machine than erase something. Yeah, yeah. Or I would use like half a reel a liter. So much liter right. tape. Like <laughs> there's no chance you were going past the liter. <laughs> right. Oh, God. So nervy, so nervy. But so he was relieved of his duties, um, but uh, he went. O he was able to go over immediately to, uh, to Hyde Street Studios and get a gig um uh so i was there and you know we we did one of their big clients was windham hill right so we so we did a lot of that sort of new agey piano yeah music. all the stuff with steven producing and mm -hmm. yeah yeah which was which was cool because like you know, Howard Johnson, who was one of the, he was the main engineer at Different Fur and one of the owners. Um, I basically kind of first learned to record piano by assisting him. Right. You know, so, so my technique is sort of an, you know, like probably all of us, we, ad, we adapt and adopt some, somebody's technique and refine it to be our own. Um, and we did, um, the the music uh for uh and score for unsolved mysteries which right was, which was uh so we did commercial work we did music work uh and uh and then also at night we would do some like local hip-hop stuff too because we had an ssl console and right that's kind of you know that that was getting its reputation for being a hip-hop console so we would um we would get a lot, you know, a very good variety of clients in there. But that job, you know, I thought, you know, it's like I drive across the country and I show up for my new job and I was all excited, you know, I'm assistant engineer. The first thing they did is hand me a bucket of white paint and told me to go freshen up the front of the studio. <laughs> so I spent the first two or three days on my assistant engineer job out front painting. That's some Tom Sawyer shit right there is what that yeah. is. That's ridiculous. But it's, yeah, that's the way it was. I mean, I, yeah, yeah. You got to do some horrible job at the beginning because if you won't do that, it means you're not really that interested. Right. I, yeah, I, yeah, I didn't, I, at the time, I couldn't figure out why they were testing me that way, you know, or what the, you know, why, why that test. But, uh, but yeah, I think you're right. And then you got into the studios right away, though. You were at, hired as an assistant, right? I was hired as an assistant. Yeah. So right. So basically, once I once I freshened the paint up out front, then I was yeah. Then I sort of started <laughs> to learn the ropes. Um, and uh, I had an um, I had my assistant engineer's job. And do you know you know Craig Sylvie, engineer mixer mm -hmm. engineer producer Craig? Okay, yeah. so Craig was actually an intern at Different Fur and Russian Hill. So he was one of my first friends right. in San Francisco. And then, um, and then he, uh, then he stopped coming to different fur because then he actually had an assistant jo job at Russian Hill and then, a, then went to up to Skywalker. Right. So. Right. And he resurfaces later. Cause I noticed like, he mixed something for you in 2012. Yeah. Which is yeah. awesome. Mm -hmm. it's, it's always great to go full circle like that. Yeah. Oh, totally. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's been, it's been really cool. Like some of the, some of my very early friends, you know, like being, being an assistant engineer and, my, and making a friend with the intern and then, you know, go on both to have relatively successful careers. And my friend, Jason Carmer, um, you know, it's just, it, it yeah, it's, it's kind of cool to sort of feel and like Eric Valentine. So it's like, there's a, there's kind of a group of us that kind of came up from the late eighties, early nineties in the Bay area, you know, and, and went on to have careers, which is, which is really cool. So yeah. I, I think that there's something to that. I think that, 
we were all sort of in an environment, sort of sharing, influencing each other, kind of we were exposed to some of the same things and it helped us grow in a, in, you know, in a similar way. Right. And did you have sort of, I mean, because you mentioned Howard, did you end up getting some sort of engineering mentorship at this point? Like, oh, holy shit, there's another level of doing this kind of thing. Or was it still just observing, picking and choosing little bits here yeah. and there? Yeah, yeah. That's kind of been the, that's, I've never had like a, a long term, you know, mentor or, or sort of somebody that I studied under. It was all just sort of bits and pieces in my yeah. own trial and error. I mean, less, less the kind of, you know, hitching your wagon to somebody, but was there somebody who came in and you were just like, holy shit, like there is another level to this kind of thing. Uh, the way, the way that guy who came down from New York was sort of like a mind blowing experience. He, uh, it's fine if there well, isn't. Not, I mean, not, you know. not someone to not someone that left that type of impression to me, honestly. Um, you know, uh, I remember at Toast, uh, I was the main engineer in Studio A, which is how I met which is how I met uh, Eric Valentine because he brought in uh, uh, Third Eye Blind. Yeah. You know, Joe Ciccarelli brought a project in. I th think the band's name was Box Set. But uh, so Joe came in and he had John Paterno engineering. So Joe and John Paterno were engineering together and I assisted them. Right. So I, and David Bianco came in right. and was doing a record for Geffen with a band um, called Black Lab. Um, yeah. So, you know, it's like I, being around, I was an intern for Dan Alexander. So, I was kind of down the hallway for, for different things and you, just kind of you're around people and it, uh, and you see things going on. So I, I, I was gaining confidence, but not really studying any one under any one right. in particular. And you were also getting into the geekery at this point, right? I mean, is this about when you were buying Pro Tools rigs and doing mm -hmm. that? Yeah. 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 Cause I, I, so well, let's go back to different fur. I worked at different fur for about six or seven months. Um, I lost my job at different fur because when we were doing un an unsolved mysteries marathon, uh, it was like two or three in the morning and I did not update the track sheet properly and a sequenced base part got erased. And I, think, I guess tension and attention was high and the um, and the client kind of was very unhappy about the situation. And so I had to be a sacrificial lamb. <laughs> Sounds like that's uh, something that just happened there a lot. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it, well, <laughs> um, yeah, I guess so. But I was, I was not able to get another job. Um, they, uh, so I didn't, uh, I wasn't able to find another assistant engineer job. So for a long time, when I lived in San Francisco, I basically, ended up doing a lot of live sound um, uh, and working in finding, finding artists to do like demos. Uh, and I'd go around to different studios. Uh, Dancing Dog was a studio that was over in the East Bay. I'm just drawing a blank on David's name, but David is a guitar player in Counting Crows. Right. And so that, that pro that project was sort of born out of Dancing Dog over in the East Bay. And, go over there and make uh, demos. I uh, made, remember making demos over there with a, with a, like a, a ska band fronted by two, two ladies. Uh, um, what the heck was the name of that? Um, the dance hall crashers. All oh, right. You know, yeah. Just, I would do, do stuff like that. Uh, Jason Carmer did some of the demos that became four non blondes. Right. You know, over there. Um, it's just, yeah, just sort of a kind of an interesting time. So after I lost my job at Different Fur, I'm doing that stuff, doing live sound, interning for Dan Alexander, um, and um, also helped with a, a studio over in the East Bay in Oakland called The Grill, which only did hip hop, like really like gangster, you know, hardcore Oakland, East Bay, like rap and hip hop. And so that was, you know, that's when, so when I started working at the grill, um, 
that's I got really into Studio Vision, like Mark of the Unicorn Studio yep. Vision. I so yeah, you know code. we kind of skipped over me yeah. getting into MIDI, but I was pretty deep into it at that point. And when the sat when the sound designer card came out, or what was it sound the sound designer two card yeah. came yeah. out with Studio Vision, you could add four digital tracks yes, with that could. card to this to the sequencing program. So in that studio, we you know we would use the Mark of the Unicorn um, software Studio Vision. What well, was opcode? Opcode, yeah, yeah, yeah opcode to 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 synchronize uh the sequencing with the tape machine and all like in the sp12 or whatever it was that was coming in that the producer had to lock everything up and and so once i was able to get that card and have the four tracks of audio then it was just like then you could actually you could fly vocals around and make vocal hooks and all that kind of stuff so that's when i that's kind of when i started and the pro tools didn't exist yet right then, then then the four channel Pro Tool system came out. Yeah. And um, Craig Sylvie got one because he, at that point, had been up at Skywalker and he had started a little rental business. He'd become friends with George Massenberg. Um, and uh, he figured out some way to finance a, uh, a Sony 3348. Wow. Back when they were got, actually they cost got, money. Yeah, real money. And that got rented a lot. And, you know, and then he got a gig as an editor on a Santana project. And that's when he got into pro tools. And so that's when I sort of had a little look at it. So as soon as like soon after that, I guess when the next incarnation of it um, came out, that's when I got into it. Like I graduated from the, the sound designer two car and the four tracks of digital audio to, I guess it was eight. The was new, the yeah. The step. new bus cards. Yeah. 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 Yep. Yeah. yeah. And then, so then, yeah, the once, and then, but studios didn't really have them. So then I owned, so then I had my own system and it would get, it, uh, the studio where I w was working toast would rent it occasionally. And, and it, you started to see like, oh, this is a, this is a, this is a technology that's starting to happen in record making, but the studios haven't adopted it yet. So they, they have to source them from somewhere. They're always renting them. And I was like, well, I'm just going to buy buy another one and we'll figure out how to buy another one so i i went into debt on credit cards to 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 get these uh pro tools rigs yeah and studios were super slow to buy them and for good reason because they didn't want to have to maintain them i mean that was they'd have to have a different staff that they didn't already have right but yeah right. the people who were smart and got the rigs and were renting them i mean you had a good 10 years of that yeah for sure for sure i realized i realized after a little after a few years of it though um, that I was the person that most people called for Pro Tools questions. And I was like, I didn't want to be that guy. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> I was that guy for years. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's fine. But then it's just like, I, you know, this is, I have other things that I want to, I'm not, I don't want to be the Pro Tools guy. It's like, it's a tool, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to be so attached to it. But at the same time, you know, it's also what gave me my opportunity to work with Tom Waits because right. of my, because of my familiarity with it. Well, we'll we'll get to that. Let's go go back a little bit just to because you did some. Um, I mean, you said oh, did a bunch of live sound, but I mean, at some pretty great places for a lot of really great bands. Which I mm. mean, and obviously, the live sound training is another thing, like jingles and voiceover and all that kind of stuff. It's just a totally different thing, but it's the same thing in a way. But you you get the immediate feedback, so I would imagine that there was a ton to take from the live sound that's actually more relevant for production than engineering in a way. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, uh, well, uh, yeah, I mean, you learn like in terms of, I think some of the skills that I developed in, if doing live sound was like mixing quickly. Cause you, you know, you know, it's just like, even when you do a sound check, um, it's really not all this, the, all the stage volumes, not really the same people, you know, it's, sound check is not as like a show the energy's yeah. more so people play louder sing louder hit the drums harder so it all changes and then the room fills up with people and so you know the the way that the the pa sounds in the room is dramatically different so you have to you have to get 
get a good mix going really fast. You know, you have to, you have to know what's important for the presentation to feel like it's together. Right. And you prioritize those things and then you, then you kind of fill in and kind of refine over the next couple songs. Right. Um, but uh, so you, yeah, you learn to be, you learn to be fast. You learn about where to place mics on stage so that you get a, a really good sound that you can crank up through the PA that's relatively isolated. Um, it's, you know, it's, you're not going to get feedback in the wedges and so forth and so on. So you, you learn about mic placement, you learn about, you know, speed, um, of mixing. Um, and, uh, yeah, there's a, just a lot of, a lot of valuable stuff there. I mean, you you are using all the same, you're using microphones and a mixing console and delays and reverbs and right. compressors and all the same stuff, but it's not at all the same target. You know, filling, filling a reinforcing a room, no matter how big, even if it's an arena, is different than, you know, balancing something for a record. Right. So right. it's like, a, it's, a, it's the same tools, but a different skill set. And they, I mean, they inform each other, certainly. So that was a, a great education. Yeah. I mean, the amount of shows that I, I did monitors for monitor mixing monitors was great training too. I think that that's where my ears really took a level up in terms of like identifying the frequencies that I was hearing. Right. You know, it's just like, cause you had to, you know, it's like, if you wanted to be good, you had to be fast. And when something started to ring, you better know where it's ring, like what the frequency it's ringing at and get it out of there. Right. Right. You know, but so, I would think there's also when you're not panic doing all of this stuff fast, you really start to appreciate performance and all of the things that go into why a show is great and why a show is bad, no matter what you do and that kind of thing. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I know you had, I mean, you were a lot of around a lot of live sounds yourself. Weren't you? I did. I did a couple of tours, um, but not, not the same way you did where you're seeing different bands every night, kind of in the same room and where I think it's a totally different way to do it. Where I, I had the experience of seeing the same group play shows where some of the shows were just better than others. And mm. you can try and figure out why and what was motivating. But I mean, you know, as a fan going to clubs in LA and seeing the same club two nights in a row first night sounds like absolute shit don't want to be there it's horrible next night it's like one of the best sounding gigs ever it's so exciting same yeah. pa even the same guy mixing sometimes yeah well you you know you learn yeah you kind of learn that it, it's really it is about performance and it's about how tight they are on stage and how well they manage their levels and so forth and so on yeah because it's that experience you're just like have a great night and everything sound sounds really wonderful. It's really easy. And then the next night you're doing the same thing and you just cannot find it. Right. And, you know, so that you realize like, ah, it's not, it's not just the job I'm doing. It's like, it's the source. It's what's going on up there. Uh, so I did, I did learn a lot. I did learn a lot about that and balancing, you know, balancing the instrumentation on stage to, so that you could present it, you know, properly to the room. Isn't, you know, another, yeah ties into that yeah for sure for yeah sure so how did you get back into studio stuff full-time not the hip-hop stuff east bay but you know the more um, well basically what got you to coast then toast and well okay so friends with craig sylvie um and then sort of in, in that well pa parallel to that friendship i made i made um another group of friends that um, uh, tied me into this band called Consolidated. And they were a Bay Area uh, sort of industrial hip hop kind of group. Um, you know, we did shows with MC Nine for Jesus and Meet Be Manifesto. Um, so they were this three piece, this three piece group. Um, and about the time I was getting to know them and doing live sound, Craig was, starting to do a little bit of stuff with them in the studio, but like not, not because Craig and I knew each other. This, so these are the parallel paths, but right. sort of, um, so we're both kind of involved in consolidated and Philip steer, who was the drummer in consolidated. Um, and Craig started doing some remix work and they, and so they wanted to have, they talked about having a studio 
And so I knew that they, I knew that they were looking for a studio because they were both my friends and, uh, and kind of, you know, the, the circle had closed a little bit more. And, um, and I just knew, well, I wanted to be involved, but I also knew that if I could help them source a studio and kind of help make something happen, that that would be an opportunity for me to actually have a studio job again, like a regular studio job. Right. Um, Cause it's like, if, well, if these guys are going to have a studio and I get offer my time to be involved, help wire it, set it up. Well, then I'm, I'm building myself a job. Um, I had been interning for Dan Alexander. I knew Dan had told me, I, I got wind that Dan had bought the, the old golden state recorders down on second and Harrison. And he was going to move from coast down to downtown to the other studio. So um, I let Craig and Philip know that coast was going to, was going to be available. Um, so they, so they got in touch with Dan and um, I don't know. I don't know if there was what the, what the negotiation was, but they ended up buying the, the, the Neve desk that was in studio a at coast uh, Dan, you know, that had been there was, he sold it to them. Um, so that, that was incredible. Cause that was a, that was a great desk, which Craig still has, he's got it in London now. And so that album that he mixed for me in 2012, is that, was it really that long? Yeah. Ago? Well, it came out in 2012 anyway. Though. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, but uh, uh, so he mixed it on that, that same desk that I, that we started at, um, that I was at uh, coast and toast. Um, yeah, we moved it. We moved in there. We, we went to Chris Haynes was the other engineer. So he was, I was sort of like the main guy in studio a because I was sort of like also like assistant engineer status as well. Right. Like I could be the first engineer, but, but because a lot, because it's the a studio more often I would be the assistant engineer. And then Chris Haynes was in the B studio and Chris, Chris was more of like, he was more vetted as a, as a, uh, a first engineer at that point. And uh, we went to, so Chris Haynes and I and Craig um, went to Denver, Colorado and got this Trident TSM console. Right. That we, that we installed into studio B. Um, I, I keep jumping around here, man. That's all um, right. Uh, so yeah, we, so um so we, uh, yeah, we turned, we took, we took toast and kind of, or coast and re re sort of revamped it and, uh, and turned it into toast, which Dan didn't really like well, very much. He was, he was pretty angry at us, but for, for do for doing that, I don't know why. Um, but, uh, so I was there. Yeah. I was there for a number of, number of years and made a lot of good friends, people that I still am in touch with and, and, uh, you know, that's where I met Eric Valentine and David Bianco and, you know, Joe Ciccarelli, John Paterno. Yeah. Bunch of hacks, basically. Yeah. Oh, and well, so I think, was your original question like how the Tom Waits thing came about? No, or? no. It's just how you got back into the studio thing. Which oh, is, sorry. How which I got back covered, into the studio. You've covered perfectly well, but we can now move on to uh, Tom Waits, if you'd like. Well. Or so, should we talk so, a little well, bit about the Black Lab thing before that? Because that's sort of a thing in a way sure yeah but you, first uh, let's talk about what you want to talk about <laughs> oh i'm happy to talk about all of it so um yeah black lab so david bianco came in and david had was one of the guys that had recently um engineered and been on the uh tom petty wildflowers record yeah so everybody you know everybody was geeked out about that drum sound on um uh what is that song uh is it Mary Jane? What is that? Oh, song? I don't remember. I'm terrible with song titles. Yeah, I'm not yeah. even going to pretend. Um, but there was a, you know, there was that one song that just had this just incredible, crazy drum sound on it. Um, you know, it was just like the really cool, compelling drum sound. And um, so it was cool getting to see David do that kind of thing. Um, I think. I think David knew how knew how it had been done, but Jim Scott is actually the one that had done yeah. it. And you know, I've subsequently been friends uh, friends with Jim Scott, gotten to know Richard Dodd, who mixed that record, who yeah. lives here. He's a very good friend too. Um, but uh, so David came in and Black so Black Lab, their band, a San Francisco band, signed to Geffen. Um, I knew 
Michael Urbano, who's a drummer in the band from just being around. And, right. um, you know, that's how I made friends with like Jeff Stanfield, who's now uh, writes for Tape Op. Uh, so those guys, you know, I learned was I learned a lot. We rented this. I remember that was the session that I heard, heard a 251 for the first time. Right. On Paul, the singer's voice. And I, I was just I literally as soon as I heard David open that mic up and Paul sing on it. I was just like, oh my God, that's that, that's that sound. That's right. it's that mic. You know, it's just because I'd heard 47s and stuff before. It's just like, whoa, that top end on that, that's different. Right. You know, um, that's just kind of like one of those moments. You just, you know, this this journey is just like tidbits of education along the way. It's just like this massive a- accumulation. Um and uh, you know, so that was, I mean working with David was like a real, a real education in itself because he was such a badass with the tape machine, mm-hmm. you know, punching stuff in. And he was, he, there again is another guy that came in, was like totally confident, make things happen. Just, you know, bam, just, and just, just very not bossy, but like confident and authoritative and kind of like was really good at directing things and, you know, in the engineer's chair. And so that was really cool. I got an opportunity with those guys. They needed to do some B sides, and they, um, they, you know, because I had been very involved in the in the making of the record. And that's also a record where I brought in a Pro Tools rig because David didn't know how to use Pro Tools, and the guys wanted to use Pro Tools for certain things, right? Uh, for some for some editing. And so, so I got I got I got um, I got to rent my Pro Tools rig to the project. Uh, and it got to show a little bit of my skills beyond being an assistant engineer. Right. And um, so then those guys asked me to do some B-sides and that's actually resulted in my first gold record because we did a song that ended up on the, um, uh, what is the name of it? It's a football movie, Hollywood Records. Uh, Man, I my brain is shit today. <laughs> That's all right. Mark's <laughs> Mark's telling us all sorts of stuff. He's like texting. And I'm not even okay, acknowledging because uh, Mary Jane's Last Dance is the song. Mary Jane's so, Last Dance. Yes, yeah. I knew it was. I knew it was. I knew there was a weed reference in there. So it wasn't. <laughs> it wasn't. Um, it wasn't Jerry Maguire and something like that, was it? No. Um, uh, anyway. No. But but what's interesting to me about this is so you're assisting and doing Pro Tools on that record. Mm-hmm. And then the guys come and say, hey, man, we got to do some B-sides. And I think a lot of people in your position would have said, like, fuck, great, man. I'm going to engineer it, and maybe I'll even get to mix it. But you said, give me co-production. Yeah. That's yeah, bold. And, well. Uh, Good man. Well, but I knew that they needed me to help them produce it. Right. You know, they weren't just – I mean, yeah, they were primarily asking me to engineer it. But that's But that happens a lot where it's just like – Hey, do you want to do this thing as an engineer? And, and it's not like they're being divisive. Like, you know, it's just, it's like, they know that you'll help them out and get, get through it, which is kind of producing too. So I, I mean, I, I knew was what was being asked of me. So, so I was like, well, can I co-produce it with you? And they said, yes. So it's brilliant. I mean, I, a lot of people just don't have the balls to ask. I mean, so. Good I man. mean, they could have said no, and I would have still taken the gig. To be right. honest, well, you know? don't don't tell them that. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it, it it is bold. It's bold, and and it's, and it's important though. I mean, in terms of like career advice, that's you can take that as a little tiny specific fact, but the idea of that is really important. It's always to represent. Yeah, make sure the people you're going to be working with understand what it is you're going to actually be doing. Yeah, yeah. Now. I'm not say, sharing this. This is like, this is, we're going into the future, but it makes me think of a, a something I want to share. And I'm not sharing it because it's like, I mean, cause I'm actually a fan of the artist. It's not, um, I just share it because it's like the, the, the power to, to be bold, speak up for yourself and sort of, you have to make choices. You have to make choices. I made a choice to speak up and be bold, uh, made a calculated risk. Um, you know, I got a call to, not about a maybe a year after the big kings of leon record where uh so that was a big that's a big deal for me as a producer right yeah i got a call to 
engineer Bruce Springsteen. And I was just like, how long is it going to, how long is this going to, you know, how long is the gig? And it was months. And I was like, as much as I would love to be there and be part of it, I don't think this is the time for me to do that. Right. Right. You know? Um, and that was like a hard, that was kind of a hard thing to, to sort of turn down. It's like, you get a call like that, you, you know, every, every fiber of your body's, you know, wanting to give the typical answer of like, yeah, I'll be right there. Yeah. You know, what you should do, you know, most of the time. But at the, at that moment, I was like, well, I've got a light, I've got a kind of a bright light shining on me, you know? And it's just like, if I, if I step out of it, you know, I'll get to do something really cool, but it could, it could take me off the path that I'm on. And I really want to be on this path. Right. I, you know, I was like, I, um, I want to be seen as more than just an engineer. Right. You know? Right. And, and it's easy to have a blip as a producer and come back. I mean, obviously this is more than a blip because that record was fucking huge, but it's, yeah, it, that's important. And that, again, it's bold. It's bold to do and well done, sir. Well, I mean, you know, sometimes I've listened, I've turned down, I've turned down projects for various reasons that have gone on in other people's hands uh, that maybe I just didn't see the same. I didn't see which. I, so I did the right thing by not taking the gig. Right. Um, but I didn't see whatever it was that came to be that made it hugely successful. But I said, and even though these are like major label opportunities, you got your manager telling you this is something they, they kind of tee you up for this. Yeah. And you just say no, because it's just like, I just, I'm not feeling it. It doesn't feel like the right move for me. And, you know, it's just like, I mean, what, why are we doing this? You know, why are we doing this? Are we, are we doing it just for, you know, the, the hope of notoriety and money? No. I mean, of course, we desire that as a result. But I, I try to just keep the, the priority of, um, you know, it, the investment of my time. Do I feel like that I have something truly to offer to it? Can I get can I get emotionally invested? You know, it's not right. just spending the time. It's like, can I really invest my time? Can I invest of myself to, to hopefully have a, a, a greater outcome? Um, so you know, just kind yeah. of have to make those decisions. Well, and I think, you know, for the people listening to this, they, most of the people listening to this, I'm sure are in the business in some way, but from the outside, it looks like we're just hanging out, having a great time the whole time. So getting paid is a bonus, but it's really fucking hard work. It really is. And that's just it's, to do a mediocre job. It's colossally hard to do a good job. So it's great to be true to yourself with that, to say, why would I put in something that's going to, that will feel even more like work because I'm not emotionally invested. Right. Now that's not to say that uh, you're, you're absolutely. And that's not to say that, you know, you, you, absolutely love every project that you're on but hopefully you can identify something about it that, yeah. that you that you can appreciate and and feel like that you can add value to it may not be it may not be music that uh that you will go home and listen to or share with everybody but you need to need to be able to feel like i can be proud of my my contribution to this and that because I honestly think that unless you are doing that, you're not really getting anything out of it for yourself. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. No, no question. You have to be proud of what you've done in the moment, even if you're never going to listen to it again. Right. Absolutely. You know. All and right. If it, even if it's just, even if it's just like, gosh, I, I, you know, it's just like, I know that per, I know that artist is talented and I like them and I'd like to help them. I'd like to help them do something positive for themselves that, i mean that to me is a that often is uh, a part of the satisfaction unto itself you know? yeah it's like and it can also be a version of the springsteen thing like that you know what working with that artist would just be super cool so that's enough at the moment for me to go and do it even if it's yeah. not my thing so but speaking of super cool artists who you actually want to work with let's let's talk about the tom waits record because mule variations is i mean i think even people who aren't tom waits fans have heard of that record like that's that's the record swordfish yeah. trombones and that one are like the ones that people know about and it's it's such a good record so i would love to hear the story i mean i've heard it but i want to hear you tell it right now 
<laughs> okay. Well, let's let's rewind and talk. Let's because it ties into how I got to the to Tom Waits gig. So let's go back to Toast and and Philip Steer. So, um, I was doing a lot of remixes with with Philip, and um, uh, so you know we had a lot of major label work. We're doing we're doing um, we're doing a bunch of remixes, and so. Uh, Philip gets a call from Island Island Records, where Tom is departing from, but uh, you know he still has like relationships there. So Kim Bowie had worked for Chris Blackwell, and Kim uh, was friends with Tom, and so he asked her who she knew of in the Bay Area that knew Pro Tools. Um, and that, you know, had, that wasn't just like some kid on Pro Tools or like somebody that only knew Pro Tools. He didn't want like a Pro Tools engineer. He wanted, he wanted a traditional engineer that knew Pro Tools. And so Kim, she wasn't aware of me, but she had a relationship with Philip. And so she called Philip thinking that he could be, that he potentially was that person. Not, not understanding that uh, I was doing the engineering stuff for Philip. Um, so he told her, he's like, well, no, it's Jakir is the person you should speak to. Um, and he, cause he also knew that I was a big Tom Waits fan. So he called me up and I was at home and uh, I thought he was playing a joke on me because he told me that Tom Waits was going to call me within the hour. <laughs> and, and I was just like, I, I, I thought he was playing a joke on me, but I remember I had, you know, in my little, my little flat, I had, um, had a little rotary phone mattress on the floor. And I just, I just sat and stared at my, sat on my, at the end of my mattress and with the <laughs> phone on the floor and just stared at it for, I don't know, close to an hour. And then Tom Waits called me. And, um, I, I don't, I don't even remember what he asked me on the phone. I don't remember. I don't really remember the conversation. I was just delirious with, you know, I was right. awestruck, uh, being a big fan, but he, he asked me, he, he asked me if I could come up to, Katadi, which is about 45 minutes to an hour north of San Francisco, up in, you know, Petaluma and Santa Rosa up in that area, uh, and meet him at the studio that he had been working at, where he made, um, like with Chad, um, at Prairie Sun, he made Bone Machine. Right. Um, I think, didn't Chad also do um, Black Rider? Did Chad do Black Rider? Did he only do... I don't know, to be honest. Well, he had, well, I, I, I mean, absolutely know that Chad had done Bone Machine. Yeah, 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 definitely and, and that they had one. Done, and then Tom had done Black Rider there as well. Um, and, you know, uh, but, so he was ready to make a new album, wanted somebody with Pro Tools, asked me if I would come up there and meet with he and Kathleen. Um, so I did, and I went, and, went up to, to Prairie Sun and met them at the studio, and we hung out for an hour or more and just kind of just talked about stuff. We talked about Alan Lomax. Um, he kind of was just kind of picking my brain about what I knew. And like, he was trying to just get a feel for what my personality and sensibilities were. Um, but the Alan Lomax thing, fortunately, I, uh, very, very well, well versed in who Alan Lomax is and the work that he did, uh, because Tom loves recording outdoor environments and found sounds and field recordings. He just likes that sort of, that sort of scratchy raw element of those recordings. Um, so we talked about Alan Lomax. He, he asked me if I, if he wanted to record in a dumpster, would I be really willing to record in a dumpster? And I was like, <laughs> so, absolutely. Dude, I've man. spent hours in a dumpster. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever you want to do, man. Um, and he, he showed me, he showed me some of the things that he had on cassette. He, he keeps, he typically keeps a micro cassette recorder on him just to record anything at a moment's notice that interests him. Uh, so, but he also, you know, he had all kinds of cassettes. And so he, he showed me a couple things and was kind of sort of talking, trying to quiz me a little bit about like what could happen with Pro Tools, just because he didn't really understand all the capability of it. He just, he, people had told him that it was a thing and that he might be, it might be useful to him because in the way that he likes to collect sounds and incorporate things, um, you know, it could be, it could be a vehicle for creativity. And he was just really, just really interested in it. So, um, 
so that conversation went well. He asked me if I could come back. I don't think he asked me at that time. He called me again and asked me if I would come up in a couple weeks for uh, like an audition session. And it, he, it, was, it was to audition musicians, right. but it was also to audition me. Um, and uh, it was an absolute train wreck of a session. Uh, I don't remember why we were having so many technical difficulties, um, what was going on, but uh, I was in an unfamiliar studio, so incredibly nervous. The, 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 the energy of the session was so nervous. Everybody, it's just like, it's Tom Waits. Every, this is like, this is a dream gig. This is like a, this is a pinnacle artist, dream, you know, icon. That's like, how amazing would it be to have this gig? So er, like all the musicians uh, show up for this session. They're all trying out. Everybody's nervous. It was a disaster. I don't think we, I don't think we recorded much of anything. Um, and uh, as the session kind of wound down, I just, I just was like, well, I'm not going to get this gig. And I just like, you know, I apologize profusely and, <laughs> and, you know, um, just said how much, so how much I appreciated the opportunity and that, you know, and it was, it was, he kind of indicated to me that it was cool, you know, it was fine. It'd be, it'd be okay. Uh, and then I was, you know, asked back to co-engineer with, with Oz Fritz, which was, which was very cool because then um, Oz and I had to spend a little bit more than a week together engineering the beginning of the album with Tom so that we were kind of on the same, he, he wanted us to be there independently because he was interested in the things that I could bring to the table and the things that Oz could bring to the table. But we all sort of collectively said, well, you know, we need to start together so that we're on the same page so that as we're bouncing back and forth and trading off right. that we, you know, we've kind of, we've set ourselves up um, uh, to be successful in that way. And um, just such a super cool thing, man. I learned so much. I learned so much about performance and what's important. Um, you know, that's where some of the live sound skills came in to play because you have to be fast. Yeah. Uh, and so at prayer, have you ever been to Prairie Sun? No. No. Okay. Well, it's on a, it's on like an old chicken ranch. So it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a farm, um, that they turned the, all the outbuildings into studio spaces. So studio a was kind of like at the, up at the top of the hill and that had a trident console in it. And was mostly for mixing. There was some like overdub space in it, um, and then Studio B was uh, a much smaller studio, and that's where the Neve console was, and yeah, a decent size, uh, a decent size live room. Uh, but Tom didn't. Tom doesn't really like traditional spaces, so we were using the control room of Studio B, and then yet another building that was sort of just. Uh, they call it the corn room or the corn. I guess it's where they used to store. Uh, it's where they used to um, keep some of the farm equipment and, and uh, I guess where they would store the corn. I don't I think they called it the corn room because they had a, a mural of a cornfield in there. It wasn't because they'd stored any corn in there, but it was just sort of a utility building. Right. Um, and in the, in a, in a small portion of that, as you entered, there was uh, this wooden room that had these, wooden double doors that opened out into the driveway and that is what's called the weight that's the weights room because that's where um a lot of bone machine and black rider had been recorded and tom just he liked the sound of that room i mean the the sound of mule variations and and this the space a lot of it is just that that little room it's wood it's a rickety wood room uh, I mean, the ceil unfinished ceiling is probably 12, 10 or 12 feet high concrete floor. Right. And, you know, put a piano, like a couple pianos in there, some instruments. Um, and, uh, and then there was a bigger spaces adjacent to it. And the, the room that had the corn mural in it, what they used as an echo chamber. So, um, so out in that space is where eyeball kid and what's he building in there? Those were those were recorded. That's that's why there's a uh, a much 
wetter ambience. It's like right. there's more there's more environment around that. And, and so we would just drag mics all around there. You'd have to run. There was no visual no visual communication. I was going to ask about that because, no. I mean, you're talking about a session that is basically freeform, chaotic, never know what's coming, but you can't see. No. No, and, and, the, and the mic lines are so long that you have to have all the mic pre's down there. Right. To drive the lines up to the to the studio to, to to print you know to put on tape, so if you've got to make a big gain adjustment, you've got to sprint over there and do it, you know, <laughs> uh, or you know, or, or have planned so that you have all the stuff done in the control room that you need done, and so that Jeff, who is the assistant engineer, could be down there, and you know, you could over the talkback speakers, you could ask for an adjustment, but a lot of times you didn't know you needed an adjustment. Till somebody's playing music and right. then you can't talk on the speakers. So <laughs> <laughs> there's a, there's a lot of running back and forth. Um, and you know, Tom is very much in the moment. He, uh, I mean, I've talked about this a lot, but one of the things I learned is just about performance. It's just about being in the moment and, uh, that the sound was really secondary to capturing the performance. Cause he really went, he wouldn't spend, a, he wouldn't spend, much of any time showing the whoever was playing with him the song he just kind of launch into it and you you know we didn't get a lot of things on the first take usually the second or third take because then at least the musician had <laughs> had a chance to hear the whole song and then let's start again right but oftentimes tom wouldn't go past three or four takes it was it, it, either we had it or we didn't he he was he felt like he felt satisfied with the performances is just in terms of what had happened and we we would be moving on to an overdub or another song but sometimes in the middle of a take he would just stop because he wasn't wasn't feeling it and then we would stay on the same song but he would maybe go from piano to guitar and that meant like moving the vocal mic and changing you know changing the setup and so you just had to be just had to be super fast and on it and just make sure you were getting getting it on tape really it's it's funny it, it's exactly the way nick lanay talks about the nick cave records too like by the third take he's bored and it's not going to do a fourth take like why would you do a fourth take you'd be saying you're never going to get it if you're up to that many so right yeah it's that's interesting <laughs> i i mean i do know i do know that uh, about that situation and and um i mean in, in a way, I mean, I think Nick Cave is the, you know, is the Australian Tom Waits. Well, exactly. And I'm sure very much on purpose in a way. But it, it's that it is that same thing, like the, the spontaneous reaction of the other musicians to the song is super important. There's no rehearsal. And then it's the moments pass. like, that's it. That's Let, it. Let's right. go. Right. It's happened or it, it hasn't. And, you know, typically, um, you know, and, and on Mule Variations, there's a few songs that had been around for a long time. You know, he'd tried them, he'd attempted them on other records, but it wasn't like, um, yeah, it's just like, well, tried it three or, three or four takes and it didn't happen on this album, so put it away. Right, there are enough songs. It's not yeah. like, you know, you got to use that And get, one. get Behind the Mule, like, so Get Behind the Mule was a song that we recorded early on in the process of Mule Variations which sort of inspired the title of the, the album. But, uh, you know, it was almost forgotten about a, f a few weeks into the process. And um, uh, in making, uh, you know, making rough mixes and, and, and making compilations of rough mixes to a cassette so that Tom could take it away and listen to it, um, came, across, came across that. And I'm like, well, I, I just was like, why are, we not, why are we not pursuing this? So I put it, I put it I, you know, I put it on the rough mix tape for him. And just sort of made mention that I included it because I thought, you know, I just just thought I should put it on there because I I thought it was really great, you know, which which was cool. And I got to um, I sort of uh, Filipino box spring hog. Oz had shared. I, I didn't know this, but but I guess Tom had confided in Oz, Oz that uh, he had tried, or somehow Oz knew this that this song had been attempted. Even Chad, I guess, had a version of it for Bone Machine, and Tom was never satisfied with it. And it seemed like it was gonna, it seemed like it was already getting sort of shuffled to the off the list of things to work on. And I, uh, 
I asked Tom when we were taking a break, he was away for a film. Um, he had a part in this movie called Mystery Man that uh, he, we, we had a break from recording because he went to film that. And I, I asked if I could take that song home with me and just kind of mess with it. So I, I chopped it up in logic and sort of reimagined it a little bit. So that's, that song got mixed actually off. That's the one song that got mixed off of a uh, DAW right. on the record. And so what's the mixing process like then? Is it more of a traditional mixing process or it's just mm-hmm. as like visceral and quick? We started out trying to, I guess we started out with a more traditional mixing process. I remember, I think Fish in the Jailhouse Tonight, or uh, which came out on, you know, the Ballers, Brawlers and Bastards or whatever, whatever Bastards, Brawlers and Ballers, um, came out on that Um but uh, so we were like, we recorded in studio B, but then we, of course we went to the mixing studio at Prairie Sun, which was up in A on that Trident and um, spent several days, as I remember working on Fish in the Jailhouse tonight. And it just couldn't get happy with it. Just wasn't feeling it. So take a break, scratching scratching the heads a little bit and then we and it's like well let's well, the rough mix has sounded really good let's just go back down to the neve um and uh so you know kind of trying to answer the question is like when we started mixing up in a it, it was more traditional it was like there's just all right there's re- we're gonna mix in now real focused effort right um but that didn't really that didn't really take and in a way the record really wasn't done yet either um, so we go back down to Studio B, and we basically picked up um, the mixing process from the rough mixes. So right. you know, because we'd had we'd we'd had a few rough mixes at this point on most of the songs, because we'd you know we'd do a tracking rough, and then um, when we when there was like a significant amount of overdubs, we'd do another one. So we just kind of went back to that, and then we'd get to a place where Tom would say, you know, I like this about mix number two, and that was maybe Oz's mix. And I like this about number five, which was your mix. So, you know, um, just, I'll be back in 30 minutes, you know, kind of put something together and, and let's see if, it, see if we've got a mix. So it's just like, you just never knew, you never knew like when he was gonna show up, if you were mixing something or if you were gonna overdub something or start something new. Right, and so it's just sort of like you just got got. I I, I always got up early because Tom, you never knew he he would drop the kids off at school some days, and just he'd show up at eight o'clock in the morning. Right, eight, you know, seven seven, but no earlier than eight, I guess. Um, I, I I'm remembering the seven o'clock hour because that's when I would get to the studio and get myself ready, um, and you just never knew what he was going to show up and want to do, and then typically the mixing was real fast, and it. Um, Oz and I pretty much did the mixing on our own, just in terms of like, you know, performing the mix because there was no automation on the console. Right. So you, you know, you just, it's manual mixing, making things on the fly. And, you know, sometimes we cut mixes together, you know, do the thing where you could get it so far yeah, and then you have to kind of, you know, stop Reset the tape. a little bit. Yeah reset and then start and then cut cut the two things together um but it was cool that way i mean i think there's there isn't really a song on the album that has less than six of those mixes to kind of arrive at whatever the end result was i don't think we ever combined mixes we didn't cut you know we didn't cut part of version four with together with version two or anything but um so it was just very you know there wasn't really an terribly organized methodical process it was just we just we were just fo- we were just following Tom's in, in you know creative intuition right and so how do you know when a record like that's done i mean tom just says yep okay we're done or like you knew we're working towards this goal or um cuz it feels know, like it's really, a record that would just really sort of formal... stop right What's like that? you would just kind of stop like oh by the way we're not coming in next week like oh right okay yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's a little bit of that i mean i seem to remember um 
we had gone over like so that he had a record deal with Auntie. that was like his first record with them uh a release date had been set so a mastering date had been set and i and we had been we had been kind of taking our sweet time and we recorded close to 30 songs you know so we had this huge uh you know list of songs we're working on and it's like so mastering the mastering date starts to become a topic of conversation. So it's, it's more like we needed it just sort of more to me felt like we were done because it was time to be done as opposed right. to like, okay, we, we we've achieved everything on the to-do list. We are now concluded. Um, and, uh, um, then it became, then the conversation became like, well, what to leave, what, what stays and what goes because it can't. And, um, having conversations with Tom about like how much time you could squeeze into one, like how much time could you get into a CD? Right. Or something like, is it 74 minutes? Is well, that 74 right? officially, but that's right about the time I think they started being able to cram 80 on there. Oh, okay. But okay, manufacturing well, could get difficult. So yes, yeah, 70, uh, well, 74 that, that, 80 minutes never so. came up. That, that would have pro probably changed a couple of the conversations. <laughs> but, but yeah, um, 7402 or some crazy shit. Yeah, yeah okay. Well, I was like, my, part of my memory is working okay. Um, uh, so even like on the... I flew down with Tom and Kathleen from, from San Francisco to Los Angeles to, to master with uh, Chris Bellman at Grunman. And, you know, I just on the plane with Tom, we're talking about what songs, you know, what songs to put on, what songs to, you know, consider leaving off. And I just remember, it's like, I learned, I, I actually didn't learn my lesson because I answered, I answered another question later, year, a couple of years later that I probably shouldn't have answered either. But <laughs> Tom was like, well, what would you leave off? And I was like, oh man, it's so hard. But obviously we need to leave something off. And he's asked me a question. Yeah. So I need to answer it. <laughs> I forget what song I said. He was, I thought he looked offended. <laughs> right. But I mean, is there any song you could have said where he wouldn't have been offended? Well, I don't know. I mean, they were all amazing. You know, it's just like, I, I mean, it was all, I mean, I thought everything, I mean, I really was kind of like, gosh, I wish we could just put it all on there, but I don't remember what I said. Um, but then it became a math problem. Every time, every time you'd, propose a sequence is like well how much time does it add up to right right and then you know it's just like oh well fuck it's too long or it's too it's it's you know we've got a we've got like a minute and a half left in this sequence yeah that's well, is it the right sequence then because i mean maybe we should put a longer song on <laughs> <laughs> you know it's just like i don't know man uh but yeah that's kind of how we that's sort of how it wrapped up i guess it wasn't wasn't really like okay we're done right you know right i do remember i do remember the, the we were, were about a week away from mastering and we were winding things up and it was it was time for me to go i think that's i think that it was i think it was all done and um i just remember uh Tom walking me to like, I, I kind of packed all my gear up and had the car pretty much loaded up. And I just had a few things like my backpack and my sleeping bag and just a few like personal things. And I remember Tom walking me to the car to, you know, just see me off, say goodbye. And, um, uh, he picked up my sleeping bag and just kind of put it over his shoulder and kind of like, well, I was like, it's like, I'm on the, you know, it's was like, I felt like, man, I'm on the road with Tom. <laughs> <laughs> Either that or he's, like or he's cool, stealing like, your sleeping bag. You know, yeah, yeah. it could be. It's like, well, this is, this is cool. It's like, we're heading off on an, it's like heading off an adventure, you know, it's like, we're going to be a couple hobos or something. <laughs> so who would have been a better hobo? Cause you've, you lived in your van for a little bit. So I did. Who do you think would be the better hobo? Cause he plays the part like he could do it. No problem. You know, but yeah, I think he probably has it hands down. Yeah. I could have kept up with him, but it like, he would have definitely been the alpha on that. <laughs> the alpha hobo. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I'm, I'm glad we sorted that out because that's yeah. super important. <laughs> well, so look, I'm, I'm aware of the time here. We're two hours in. Okay. But we're also, that same year is not quite the um, the thing in terms of maybe visibility. I mean, obviously recording and mixing that album is huge. 
Mm-hmm. Um, but that's also the year where you started assisting for Eric Valentine on the Third Eye Blind record. Yeah, yeah that's right. And that's sort of and a that's big also deal. At, right after that the th- the Black Lab thing. You know, all right. all that stuff is kind of happening at the same time. Right. So and it must have felt pretty good, like stuff starting to happen i mean even though you're you're starting off assisting for eric it feels like a a thing absolutely you know absolutely and you know eric after after a few days you know we had become we had started to become you know friendly you, you know it's like we were in, you know kind of becoming friends the start of a friendship and uh you know i think we were about maybe a week into like a few week run and i just remember as we were saying good night one night, he just, you know, he just kind of like, um, Eric's, you know, Eric doesn't, he doesn't mince words. He's just like, he's, you know, he's very much to the point, very, you know, very, very respectful, very smart, but, you know, just, but very much to the point. And, um, but he's, he's super genuine and kind and, uh, just couldn't, can't say enough good things about him. If, uh, just at the end of the night, he's like, he just, he said, you know, thanks for a good, good week. He's like, I realize that you're overqualified to be my assistant engineer, but I really appreciate how hard you're working. And that made me, that made me feel really good. Um, and um, so it's like, okay, well, it's just like, I think this guy's amazing. And he, he sees that I'm more than just like some, you know, assistant engineer, wannabe engineer. Um, so that, that felt really good. And then, you know, it was probably close to a year later that he called me up and said, you know, I have this record that I'm going to do pre-production with, for, but I can't actually start it when they want to start. Would you go, I'll have, I'll have sorted out that, you know, I'll have done the pre-production. So like the, there will be the kind of like a set of assignments to get the record started. Would you go on my behalf and start the record at, you know, would you go and I want you to engineer on this record. Would you go and start with them? Um, that was huge. Yeah. That was like a huge acknowledgement. Huge acknowledgement. Yeah. And a massive amount of trust. Yes. Yeah. Because, I mean, yes. first of all, there's the whoever's going to do it has got to do a good job and get the record started properly and whatever. But there's also the, you know, you leave someone alone with the band and get the record going and they're going to try and steal your gig. Or like there's got to be a little bit of that going on, too, though. I think Eric was probably pretty confident at that point, like that wasn't going to be a thing. But he yeah, had to he, trust I, you I, that implicitly. Was, he also though. knew that was not my M.O. Well, exactly. I mean, that's the thing. Like that, you were not that guy. That no, wasn't going to happen. No. So this no, is the I mean, Citizen King record, right? Yeah, Citizen King. Yep, yeah. and the big, the 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 single off that was Better, Better Days, which was a pretty pretty popular song. Yeah, that's cool. It was fun. It was fun doing that. You know, th- um, that was another opportunity to to sort of um, you know get to do my own thing, but sort of learn and experiment along with, with Eric. I mean, what's really cool about my relationship with Eric and the time we spent together is he, even though sometimes I was working, I like on the third eye blind, I was his assistant, right? But every other, you know, every, after that, he always, it was always like, we're engineering together, you know, and it's like a real exchange of ideas and we were peers and, you know, I shared things with him. He shared things with me. It was, it was just a really, really cool time. And then um, he didn't really need me on the second Smash Mouth album uh, for any of engineering because he, he was, you know, he kind of had a thing that he was doing. He was very specific with it, but he did get a little bit of behind on the editing. Um, and he asked me if I'd come down. And, and so I did, I, you know, I helped, I helped quite a bit on that at, at the, at the start. And then, um, and then All Star came around, and and uh, you know got to participate on that, and that was that was also a really cool thing to see happen with All Star, if like because he did a re-record of it for the um, what's the movie with uh, you know Eddie Murphy's the donkey and uh, the oh uh, yeah Shrek. Uh, Shrek. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So it was a big, like, so all star being in Shrek was a big deal. And then he did the, the monkeys. Uh, then I was, it, now that I saw our face. Right. Is that what it was? That what it was? We did a monkeys cover for that movie so. too. Right. Yeah. Now I'm a believer is what now it's a believer. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, now yep. I'm a believer. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, getting to, getting to see 
Eric do that cover song and participate in it and, and sort of see all that stuff happening and, and getting a sense of like a, how to, how to do rock music for, a, you know, a motion, like a, you know, a big Hollywood kind of production thing. Um, you know, participating in all that stuff was so, so super cool. We, um, Eric and I went out, uh, we were kind of, uh, I know you talked to Lily white recently. Mm -hmm. Um, so he, Steve did a record with Counting Crows called Hard Candy. And Eric and I were one of the producer engineer um, teams that were auditioned for that. Right. Um, and uh, so, you know, that was kind of a, that was kind of a cool, cool time. And, um, you know, the band, I remember the, the uh, couple of guys in the band thought, you know, they really, they really enjoyed everybody, but they, they told me that like, they told me it's like it would have been we 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 talked about seeing if you know because we, we chose lily white if we could get you to come in and engineer with steve and i was like oh damn why didn't that happen <laughs> <laughs> but you know you, you don't break up you know you know so that i'm i'm sure steve had a very good engineer relationship i don't know who it was but they ended up making the record but that's kind of like eric and i did cool stuff together like that you know it was, so it's super fun right i think it's great too because i mean obviously eric's a great engineer the same way Steve is a great engineer but I think both were always really happy to have somebody to engineer with them mm -hmm. which is a you've got to you've got to have a lot of confidence in yourself to do that as well which is great but I am too I I mean I am too you know it's like uh I've kind of gone back to doing more of my own engineering now just because I kind of missed it a little bit but I love uh engineering partnerships right that's great yeah. It's great. I mean, it just strangely, I don't think, I mean, I was on projects with more than one engineer, but um, yeah, I don't think I did too many like that. And it's a, just a different thing where, and it also takes some pressure off, which is great. It does. Like if something's not going your way, the other person's going to jump in. Yeah. Or at least be objective enough to say, dude, go check that out, you know? Right. No, it's, it's totally true. And I mean, you know, and working with Oz was a great experience in that way too. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't know, I've always been, I've, yeah, I've kind of always been open to the idea. It's just a big collaboration really. You know? Which I think is great. Cause it's also, I mean, we're jumping way ahead, but I mean, you've been really good about having a staff around you while you're producing records people who stay with you and they're your engineers for years and they really get their hands dirty and it's not like oh yeah i got an assistant and then when they want to be an engineer they go off and do their thing like they do it with you for a while which is great mm -hmm. yeah I've, i enjoy i mean i enjoy the i just enjoy those relationships and and you know and learning from learning from their growth you know and as you know as you teach as you sort of teach or share things you you know Oh, excuse me uh you learn yourself you know oh absolutely just being able to put something into words or recreate it and not just be kind of winging it all the time which not winging it but you know following instinct without thinking too much it's a totally different thing to teach people about it yeah absolutely well i listen man um yeah i i, I mean i don't have to go right now um probably <laughs> you know i don't have to go right now but just sort of thinking about where we where we are in the conversation i know we kind of skipped ahead i don't know if yeah. you want to go back to anything but well, but you, 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 we do want to do a question and answer. Well, yeah, we. Well, I'd love to do a little Q and A. I mean, is there anything in particular that we've skipped over that you feel we should we should get into? There's uh, also this one. There's a great thing. I can't remember what interview it was that you were giving, um, but or who it was with. But you're talking about kind of the transition to from engineering to mixing. And like, well, mm -hmm. how do you even get the opportunity? And I loved your answer to that. And I think it was from about this time in your career, which was yeah. you just do fucking awesome rough mixes. Yes. That's, <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's the, that's it. I mean, that's your opportunity to shine, you know, uh, just do, when you have an opportunity to do great rough mixes, you know, uh, get it done, you know, or, or, and you know, cause somebody might, somebody might walk in on you and hear, hear it and kind of get a sense of like, Oh, this, this guy's kind of got it going on. Um, yeah, just do great rough mixes, take any opportunity, take any opportunity, um, because that leaves an impression, you know, and cause they're going to go, they're going to go away and listen to that. And, you know, it's just like, 
people in the same way people get demoitis or they get stuck on the rough mix. It's like, because they spend a lot of time listening to it. Yeah, absolutely. So it's a perfect opportunity to get yourself ingrained into someone's, you know, awareness. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, we could, we could, um, I mean, there's a little bit more of the, uh, the Eric story because I mean, that's what got you down to LA, right? Was going yes, down yeah, with yeah, Eric. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. do you want to do that? And then a little Q and a, oh, well, yeah, we're already at nine 30. It's completely up to you. We are obviously doing a part two and you're not going to be okay. able to get out yeah. of that. Well, yeah. Okay. So, um, I have, it's nine, well, nine 30 there. Yeah. Yeah. Nine 30 here. So we're two um, hours in. So, yeah, so talk a little bit how, about about getting down to LA and then we'll pick up there because I think that's by the time you're sort of in San Francisco, LA and Nashville all at the same time, that's like the next kind of step. Yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um what took me down? Well, so Eric um unfortunately for Eric, he uh he had a bit of a he had you know, and I don't know I mean, you interviewed him recently, so yeah, and we and I, need to do a part two. So if you say something really horrible, we'll be able to talk about it. So feel okay. free, talk well, it's about not anything. horrible, but you know, it's like <laughs> you know, I don't know, I don't know how much Eric talks about this or how much to share, but I will say this. So what I can say, because I don't think this is like off the record, but um, you know, Eric had a Eric. Eric basically built his. He was in a band called T Ride. Yep. T Ride got a major got a major label deal, so they yeah. had a lot of money to play with. Yeah. And Eric had Eric had engineered and produced the project, so basically, he's able to take on this money, and he kind of blows his studio out. He got he kind of like, yeah, jumps into the studio. So the studio is is really a a partnership because of the bands, you know, creating the from the record deal, creating the funds to so the studio is really a partnership even though it's eric's baby you know he's he's the only one running it he's doing all the work and he you know he became successful and his old bandmates partners um you know they came sniffing around for money and it kind of it it complicated his life in the bay area and the uh, in Red, redwood city and the studio right so he kind of had to shut things down Things are going really well for him. So he, and he had some opportunities to be down in LA. And he, I, I think he just deal, you know, dealing with that whole, that whole thing, it kind of, uh, it got him out of the Bay area and he, he just sort of, I think he felt like getting away from it. I and mean, he should probably speak to all that stuff, but so yeah, that, I mean, he, he basically told that story. Okay. You it know. took him down to, it took him down to LA. Um, I haven't yet had an opportunity to listen to that. Um, took him down to LA. And, um, so, um, he, when he was working on, was it the third smash mouth record? He was working on it. He was working on, you know, he's very busy. And, um, so he called me up and he had another record. He's like, I need your help with a, a record, you know? So, and he had a B studio down there. So I came down to LA to help him with a band called ghetto blaster. I think they were signed to Electra, um, and so I'm kind of working in. The, we we did the basic tracks together in A studio, and then he had to go back to another project, and then I was over in the B studio uh, doing overdubs and so forth and so on. So that's that's kind of what took me down to L.A. more long term, and I thought you know I really enjoyed working with Eric, uh, and I I was really seriously considering the long like the long term you know opportunity that that might be you know because we're having this repeat work and now he's got right. me down in la and it's a you know great gig and you know i'm getting paid well really good friend so i you know so i was spending a lot of time in la so um we uh you know and he offered me the b studio and that's another that's another one of those moments where it's like you know, I had an apartment in LA. I was spending a lot of time there. Um, we were doing a lot of work together and he, he just kind of offered me, he's like, Hey, do you want to sort of take over studio B and be here, you know, be here full time and have that have your, be your room when you're doing your own thing. And, um, you know, I thought about it and thought about it and I was like, man, I, you know, I 
thank you. But I think what I need to do is I need, I think I'm going to, I'm going to make a life decision and I'm going to move to Nashville, you know, and I'm going to, I'm going to, instead of moving my new family, my, my new marriage, new family to LA, I'm going to go the other way and I'm going to go, I'm going to go there. I think it's going to be a better, uh, better situation for my, for my family's life right? to go to Nashville. And I, so I may, you know, I moved to Nashville, not for the music business, but for my, you know, for my, my family and my love of my wife and, and just those, those things. And um, so I turned it down, you know, it's like, here's another great opportunity that, you know, I just had to make a hard choice and sort of stick, stick to what I thought was the right, the right move right. at that time. Right, which is again bold, um, but it's but also you were still ending up spending quite a bit of time in L.A. even after oh, you yeah. moved to Nashville, right? I mean, because it's yeah, inescapable. The first, I think, the first six or seven years that I that I lived uh, in Nashville, I was gone half the time in California. Right. You know, uh, that Counting Crows uh, week that the, the week that Eric and I um, did that sort of audition week with the Counting Crows. Uh, my youngest son was six days old when I left. Right. So, you know, by the time I got back, I'd already missed half his life, <laughs> you know? So, and that's, you know, that kind of, that kind of continued to be a theme. I mean, I went to, when he was about four or five, went to Australia, you know, you don't go to Australia and come home on the weekends. No, you know, I went to Australia. I went to Australia for seven weeks to make a record. Right. You know, it's just like, it was brutal sometimes the time away, but that was the right, that was felt like the right thing to do for me, you know? Right. That was the right thing to do for me. Right. Cause then at least when you're not working, you're home in a place that everybody actually wants to be. Right. Which is a Absolutely. big deal. It's a, it's a really Absolutely. big deal. But, you know, going back, you know, but, but yes, I kept going back to, to uh, barefoot and working with Eric and, you know, I was, I was on a project with Eric, which we, I know you've already indicated that we'll save this for, part two, but that's, you know, but that's where I met. That's where, uh, I sort of got connected with Ethan Johns. Right. Right. Which will definitely, yeah. The whole Kings of Leon, Ethan Johns thing. That's, that's a big topic. That's a yeah, very big yeah. topic. So why don't we bring in Mark and do a little Q and a, and then you can get off to the thing you got to do. I'll stop at a reasonable time as opposed to one in the morning, which is nice. <laughs> and we will, we will reschedule you for part two. Okay. And that that I like that. I like that. That's okay. that's good. I've been awesome. super super enjoyed talking to you. I, good. This has been so much fun for me. I love just filling in all the blanks on this stuff because it's fascinating. And it's also I think a lot of people I talk to, you sort of pick up the the consistent threads and the consistent thread with you is the really thoughtful decisions, like the long-term big picture decisions, not being a magpie not chasing shiny things you know and really saying like like holy shit springsteen like that's the kind of gig that i would take because it's like well i'm just gonna go do that but it's it's obviously the right decision you know and it, it's great to see how it's been a um just a really thoughtful progression to get to exactly where you are which is i'm assuming exactly where you wanted to be pretty much i guess you know, well, I mean, do we actually do we actually truly understand where we think we want to go? What, like, no, but you know, and no. it does, it's definitely not all that you think it's going to be when you get there. But, but yeah, to a large degree, yes, I'm. I feel fulfilled by my my career. Um, a lot of the you know the the shiny thing goals that I set out when I was starting happened. Yeah, um, in a big you know, way, and I have been very fulfilled. Um, you know, uh, it is it has, it has sustained me and I, you know, it has sustained me and I've been, I've been successful enough, um, that yeah, it's, it, it turned out, it turned out well, yeah. but it, I had, I would have had no, I, I, there's no way I could have conceived of, um, you know, the path and, and how it feels to have arrived, you know, it's just nice that it's nice that it happened. Yeah, absolutely, and that and that you don't get to a certain point and regret earlier decisions. Like they've all gone how you thought because you were making decisions based on actual thinking, which is not something everybody does. Yeah, you're, but you're a, but 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 we continue to make you know, 
not every decision is a great decision. No, 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 obviously. But you also, the same way you make what you think is a decision to put yourself in a good place, you never put yourself in such a precarious place that it no. could all go to shit. So no, that, I've, that fortunately I've never, that fortunately I've never done. I mean, I, uh, I would, yes, I've been pretty thoughtful about. Yeah. And, and, you know, I didn't say, I, you know, when I, it's crazy to say that I turned that gig down with Bruce Springsteen. I mean, it really, it really is. No, and I but it's say, not. I couldn't say no when I was asked. I was like, I need to, I need to call you tomorrow. Right. Which is like, smart. Need, it's because... like, wow, this is a big decision. I need to think about this. I need to talk to my wife about it. You know, it's just like, I need somebody to, yeah. you know. Who was producing on that? Huh? Who was producing on that? Ron and Yellow. Right. Okay. And, you, you know, go. and I'd worked with Ron before. I mean, uh, so, I mean, I knew that he was great to work with. We, um, uh, we did something together. Oh man, here, here I go forgetting another name. Um, but we had worked together before. So right. I knew that it was a, I knew that it was a good situation. Right. You know, I, know, I mean, I knew that, it would, I knew that it would be a good time. It, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be walking into an unknown producer engineer relationship. No, but I mean, look, I, because I've had some, I've had some rough goes in that area too. But to put it into perspective, I mean, we're not talking about like you got the gig working on a soundtrack record that did okay. Or the movie was big. What, like this is a record that won record of the year. And I mean, the, the number of streams on the two big hits from that record are they're in like baby shark territory. You know, yeah. you're talking about I still, I mean, I, how many still, parts like, of a billion. Honestly, man, on my <laughs> on my streaming royalties, they're they're still in the top ten. Yeah, they're they're well over half a billion streams on Spotify alone. It's crazy. Yeah, really crazy. I'm very. I count myself very. <laughs> You know, very fortunate to have uh, had that opportunity. Yeah, I mean, and I would say that you've probably made enough income from that record that you should buy yourself a second Oratone. That's <laughs> <laughs> you can afford oh, it, man. On, man. No, I'm, I'm putting I'm putting that money in Bitcoin, baby. <laughs> <laughs> excellent, excellent. And on that note, let's bring in the crypto king, Mark Abrams. He's, or did he go, is he taking a nap or is he coming in? He's probably checking his farming computers right now. He probably is. He's probably switching. His mining that. computers. Yep. He switched that shit right back on. Well, apparently <laughs> it's doing something to my network because I can't see my uh, my screen that's going over a nerdy thing called AirPlay. Um, <laughs> so we'll just do this. We can and, hear uh, you. Yeah. I got oh, there you on. are. There we go. We'll just switch that over to the logo thing. Smooth sailing. <laughs> There's my phone underneath that. Cool. Nothing to see here. <laughs> awesome. It's a smooth cool. operation. Yes. Um, th so this has been incredible. Just hearing so so much of this backstory is awesome, and I think it's uh, it's really useful because like so much of it's from you're getting started days and hearing those like even those horror stories about the um, the leader tape and everything has been really really interesting. So. Uh, we have 20 questions here for you. Okay. So, um, well, it's up to you how, gonna quick, get to all these. how quickly yeah. you answer them. So. <laughs> well, right. let's, let's see, let's get started and see how we do. Okay, cool. So how it works is on Crowdcast, uh, people can submit a question and then, um, upvote each other's questions. And, uh, we have like the most upvoted ones first, and then we'll kind of go down through it. So our first most upvoted question is from Bing and Bing says, hi, Jakir, and thanks for the knowledge sharing. Would you have some thoughts or advice about managing overall compression? I often feel like I'm going too much on the compression because I'm afraid of not having enough energy and life in the mix. It's often something I won't notice while I'm mixing, but afterwards. Um, yeah, well, I mean, oftentimes the reason a mix doesn't have energy is because the compression has been kind of overcooked. Um, I mean, my personal approach in mixing, like compression and mixing, is I always start with a little bit of, I always start on the mix bus. You know, add a, you know, I don't do like heavy compression on the mix bus, but there is a bit of glue and shape that happens there. And then kind of work backwards from there. Um, you know, I, 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 I have observed this about myself recently that I'm using less compression as, as the loudness things start to just like not, they're not going away, but as it's less of the, 
absolute focus of everybody where things are getting a little bit more dynamic. I've, I've begun to use a little bit less compression. I mean, I'm almost always doing parallel compression on drums. Mm -hmm. Um, sometimes, you know, like Andrew, like similar thing to what Andrew does is, uh, I don't know if he's still doing it, but like a back bus, yeah. um, like a, you know, so I, I t typically, unless I'm going for a very specific, heavily compressed sound, I'm, I'm just using light touches of compression on individual things. And if I want a heavily compressed sound, I do it in parallel so I can blend it in. Um, you know, one plug in that one plug in, and this is, you know, Andrew's, Andrew's, uh, Omni channel is an awesome plug in on a bus because um, you can, you can just get, you can get a lot of work done with it. I, I like it. Be, um, I like it because you've got the three styles of compression, you've got a mix knob. Um, so I don't use it on, I mean, certainly I change up what I'm doing based on what I feel like the music needs in terms of a template, you know, I, like I have a template that kind of is architecture, but then, you know, the, the dynamic control or the flavors that I choose de will change depending on what the source material feels like it needs. Mm -hmm. um, but like stuff, especially that's got a lot of already baked in personality. Um, I'll use, I'll use the Omni channel on just because it's, it, it, you don't have to do a ton of heavy lifting, but it's, you can do so many surgical things with it. And uh, if you want a heavy compression sound on a, on a, on a bus, or like a, you know, like an instrument group or something, um, you can do that and then just sort of mix it into taste, you know, mm. um, that's, you know, I just mentioned that cause I'm on with Andrew and I love that plug in <laughs> and made, made me think of it. I knew um, I liked you, but, that, but that's a, but that's a, but it's a, like, it's a really good way to experiment and do something quickly and efficiently. Otherwise then, yeah, you are having to create parallel paths and, and blend, you know, just sort of figure out how to build that architecture. Hopefully that ho being, hopefully that gives you a little bit of insight. You know, it's just like, you're probably just, you're probably just working the individual elements too hard through compression. Uh, when, when you desire a compressed sound that's heavy, do it in parallel and, and start with your mix bus as the, as the place to get that glued together sound. And then you'll, you'll f be less fussy with all the individual things to get it there. Does yeah. That, does that make sense? I would agree hundred percent about start with the mix bus and start with that early because it's the character of the sound. You can't do a mix and then compress it because now you're changing the mix. So get the compression in really early on. Like as soon as you've got rhythmic elements, you'll know if it's the right thing. And then you can always back off how much or whatever, but yeah, absolutely agree. But these questions aren't for me. So next, <laughs> okay awesome all right our next question is from jason and he says hey jakir word on the street is that you have a very interesting approach to mixing between 240 hertz and the 4k range can you talk a bit about that method hmm uh i don't know what that means what's interesting about it i mean 200 to 4k uh I mean, I guess maybe I'm just trying to think about what maybe I've said that has been interpreted that way um, in the past. I, I guess, right. I mean, that frequency range is where you have the, that's where almost everything overlaps. That's, well, that's where everything does overlap. Yeah. And, the, you know, the sort of the bottom end of that is where all the primary tones are and where all the mud is. And so you have to do, there's a lot of shaping to be done and you have to be really, decisive about how you know depending on what the the genre is and and the elements and how it needs to fit together you have to be now if something's like very dynamic and organic and there's not a lot of elements it's okay if that stuff's a little bit messy because that's part of the magic of how it all kind of fits to you know how it all lives together but you know, if you've got a lot of elements, you got electric guitars, you got synths and, you know, background, tons of background vocals and strings and on and on and on, you really have to compartmentalize things in that range. Um, so, I mean, maybe that's what it's about. So you just need to be really decisive about your, you know, where you're fitting things together. And, you know, I typically approach it um, as opposed to cranking a bunch of stuff to to make things poke out in those in those ranges where you want them to fit together i just i i turn i like car, carve stuff out you know 
mm-hmm. because especially in the digital realm, I think EQ in general sounds better when you're cutting like an extreme cut to me sounds better than an extreme boost. Mm-hmm. Um, and it just fits together better. I mean, typically traditionally it's, it obviously the plugins and digital technology has come so far. It's like, it's not even really a discussion anymore, but you know, 10, 15 years ago, digital EQs, the harder you pushed them, they didn't really sound like analog EQs and things got really messy. So like the habit of cutting stuff as opposed to trying to boost stuff to make it poke out was where I would always, always start. So maybe, maybe that's what it's about. I, you know, I, other things that makes me think about that, you know, I'm not a particularly a big fan or user of multiband compression. I do mm-hmm. use it. Um, but I, you know, I'm talking about dividing things up into uh, frequencies, but I don't do it with like multiband compression kind of, kind of things. It's, uh, you know, it's like if the, if the, if the drums are fe- like, they feel like they're really, really bright, then I'm, then I'm gravitating towards um, things that will kind of darken them up and give them tone and kind of roll the top end off and mm-hmm. kind of make it, you know, fatter in the bottom. I, you know, that's, that's the, I'm not exactly sure where the question stems from. So that's the best I can answer it. Yeah. Cool. Okay. That's great. Um, just to, to add on to that, do you have a go-to for doing what you were just saying about the drums where you're kind of like rolling the top off and. Uh, no, it just it completely, yeah. de- it's just to completely dependent on what, what it feels like it needs to fit together and like what the tonality, like where I feel like in general, most records have a play, like a, 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 f- spectrum that they live in you know it's like it's more it's like the glue is in the bottom end or the glue is in the mid range or it's about the top you know and and then everything kind of like fits together and and so if i if i've got like a drum kit that feels a little too bright for where that that marriage of sound and needs to be mm-hmm. then yeah i might choose something like i don't know i might eq off some of the top end i might pick some tube tube type limiters uh on um on some of the Kings of Leon stuff, I mean, I, I never tried to overly discourage Nathan from playing the cymbals really hard, and he would sometimes. So sometimes I'd have to throw de like I'd have to automate de to come on uh, on the on some of the drum channels so that I didn't have to make um, balance and uh, EQ choices that would sort of fix that in those moments. So, yeah. Right, right. Awesome. Um, Okay, our next question is from James, and James says, uh, "Hey, Jakir, what advice would you give to young engineers or producers looking to start up a home studio business? What are the key aspects and most important facets of creating a successful studio for clients?" Mm. Well, I guess if 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 you're, it needs to be com- it needs to be comfortable, and f- and it needs to be comfortable. I don't know. It's kind of, I'm thinking about the world we're living in where we're not really getting together that much, but um, right. it needs to be comfortable for you. Uh, it has to have a good workflow and be efficient. You know, I don't know what kind of studio you're talking about putting together. Like if it's a analog studio or it's kind of something that's real simple where you've got, you know, mostly in the box. Um, but, you know, make sure that whatever room you're setting up in, that the, the thing that you prioritize is your speaker placement. And then build your build you know build yourself in around where the best place to uh, put the speakers because really your output is you know is dictated by the way that you perceive the material and that's your speakers that's your lens that's your lens so mm-hmm. to be successful in that way I, if this is sort of a business question um, you just need to set yourself up in a way that you can do your best work and be consistent and efficient about it. So like if you're jumping around project to project or you're bouncing between mix recalls, you know, um, you just need to be able to uh, to do that well and not create a bunch of extra work for yourself. I don't you know, it's, it's kind of a hard question to answer. You need to be yeah. you need to be true to yourself. You need to set yourself up in a uh, uh, in a thoughtful way. Don't forget about the things that you're going to need. Just a, pra- so a practical thing is don't forget about the things that you're going to need. Um, like headphones and microphones and wires and, uh, and all, you know, all the things that make it all work together, because I think a lot of people get excited about the idea of having a, a studio 
and they, you know, it's like, well, I want to buy these pre's and this compressor and this microphone. And then you spend all your money on that stuff. And then you, you realize that to actually have good wire to hook it all up is a couple thousand dollars too. You know? Yeah. And I, I think uh, that right. the headphone system is the most overlooked part of any tracking studio. The headphone mix is why people play well. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. So, um, yeah, that's my answer for that. That's great. Um, cool. How are you doing on time? Uh, uh, let's take a couple more questions. Okay, cool. So, uh, first one is from Paul and he says, hi, Jakir. I was wondering if you have a formula or timeline for projects, like how much time is spent on pre-production tracking, mixing and mastering. Um, well, my, I, you know, I don't necessarily have a strict formula because every, I, I, I approach everything is different, but I mean, I can basically calculate that if you're doing pre-production for a whole album, three or four days should be sufficient. You know, you should be able to kind of do three-ish songs a day. I mean, that's a, it's a lot and it's fatiguing for everybody because basically you're talking and thinking about and playing the songs all day long. Um, maybe you could go faster. It just sort of depends on, uh, that depends on how much relationship building you need to do, how much, how much of the basic song identifying, arranging, kind of the, the bigger gestures, start the conversation. So a day or two of like in-person pre-production just to kind of get on the same page and do some of the, the bigger things. Um, I mean, you really should be able to record a song in two or three days tops. Like, uh, you know, you may not do it all back to back to back, but at the end, the average, um, f for me at this point, I think the average is three to four days from the starting of the recording to the finishing the mix, like of accumulated time. Right. So um, you just budget your, you know, budget yourself accordingly. You know, sometimes, especially when you're, when you're doing everything, um, the mixing is gonna take you longer because you've heard it a bunch and you ha have to be objective and you kind of have to form a new relationship with it. Um, I typically, like to take a break at the conclusion of production before I get into mixing. I, I definitely like to have at least a week, if not two or three mm -hmm. to, to clear my, to get it out of my system and to be able to kind of come back and be a, be efficient, um, uh, with it. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, I think an indie project, there's, there's nothing like if you're doing an indie project, you should be, um, you should be able to, to basically record a song in a day. Mm -hmm. maybe two and and so you've so it just depends on how much how much money you have and 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 resources but uh if you're if you're spending more than four days and something's wrong something's wrong i mm -hmm. think yeah great okay uh next one is hi andrew hi jakir this is from zeke and zeke says thanks a lot andrew the series has been amazing you have no idea or maybe you do I'm an inspiring, <laughs> I'm an aspiring mix engineer from Nigeria and I've only ever worked in the box. My question is when you get a song to mix that's recorded totally dry, what's your thought process on approaching reverb? Thank you. Um, well, I mean, if the, well, I guess the intention, like totally dry, meaning that there's no, there has, I, I guess I'm trying to figure out what the, how to interpret it. Um, yeah. Maybe let's say like the scenario is that you just get this completely dry multi-track that doesn't really have the sound baked into it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, you, you just have to, I mean, I guess I do a lot of it intuitively, really. I mean, almost always you, you want to, you, almost, almost always the thing that you're going to put some effects on is the voice. Right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so you have to think about what's appropriate. Like, is it a hall? Is it a plate? Is it a chamber? What's the right feeling reverb? Uh, do we want very audible, like longer throw delays as, as part of the feel of it? Uh, or is it just about, you know, shorter slap delays? Is it something that should feel pretty dry? I mean, these are just things you kind of have just to react to it. Mm -hmm. um, even when something feels pretty dry it, you can still sneak some reverb in there some room tone to kind of fill it out and kind of 
add some color and space to it. Uh, you know, drums, depending on how drums have been recorded, even, even if you have room sounds, it's nice to, to add a little bit of reverb to the snare drum and the toms just to give them a little bit of a bigger voice and give them a, um, a little bit more connective tissue, I guess, to the, the ambient space. And then really, I mean, for me, uh, I'm almost always gonna use some type of reverb on the vocal and a little bit of reverb on the drums. The rest of it's really, you know, it's kind of taste stuff. Sometimes you, sometimes it's nice to put like a, a reverb on an acoustic guitar to just to get it, not to make it sound like it's in reverb, but just to kind of give it a little bit of that dimension and glued tonality to things or, um, it really depends on the style of the music. I mean, if you're doing funk, if you're, it's like, if it's like funk horn, like if it's a funk thing, it's, yeah, it's probably going to be pretty dry and tight sounding. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, because, the, because it, it's also the way, you know, like I say funk music, because the rhythm section is always really tight. They're always kind of most, not always, but most often they're doing stuff together. There's a lot of rhythmic stops and, and a lot of syncopation that needs to be really articulate and tight. So you don't want to muddle it up with, with reverb and delay um, necessarily. Um, uh, so yeah, I guess it's just kind of an intuitive thing. I wish I had a, a better answer, but thing, you know, things like strings or horns, you know, you generally, I also think about things of like, well, what's the normal, what's maybe a normal environment that I hear this in, or you, you might hear it in, and maybe that's a place to start thinking about how to treat it. It's um, because with me, I think I've, because I spent a lot of time in live sound and I, I'm very visual about the way I think about presenting the sound stage, that it's like, it, it's like theater, you know, it's just like, I'm, 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 creating a vision that makes me feel like it has depth and I'm in a, I'm in the space with the music. And because of all my live sound time, it's just like, I start to picture like where people are on stage and sort of their depth of field and their placement and mm -hmm. like how, how, how they're lit even, you know, kind of gives a bit of a, that's like, you can take cues from that. So I, I kind of try to think about that. And, you know, if I'm listening to a horn section well they're typically a horn section they horn players like being in reverberant rooms because it kind of because they they can they hear themselves back you know when a, when a horn player warms up or, or or they go and stand against a wall because the sound's all shooting out of the horn and it's not really hitting their ears it's just going away from them so they like the sense of the sound coming back so i mean it just kind of makes that sort of putting reverb on that kind of sound makes sense so let's answer one more question great Okay. Uh, well, I'm going to uh, two, do a I'm, very yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. I have a short. Let's just keep one. going. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. I All right. I can. I'm gonna. I'm gonna push it to. I'm gonna push it to the max. Okay. All right. We'll uh, we'll do the the short one here. So um, this one's from Ricky. It's the most up uh, next most upvoted question, and he says, "How do you deal with stress during a production? And have you ever told a band that they suck?" Uh. <laughs> well. I'll answer the second part first. Not exactly, but yes. Mm. I, I haven't like gone out. I haven't ever gone out into the room and been like, what the fuck? You guys suck. Why are you wasting my time? I, I've mm. never done that. I, I, I have on many occasions um, when things aren't going well, it typically happens in, most often happens in the beginning of the, the process because everybody's nervous, trying to find their, trying to find their footing um, it's like new relationships, the headphones aren't really together. People don't know what to ask for. Um, so what I'll, what I've done is I've, you know, I'll just say, Hey, uh, okay, come in here and listen to this with me and just listen back to whatever we recorded. And, and it's, and it doesn't really sound that great. It's not, you know, it's not terrible, but it just, it doesn't really feel like it's not what anybody wants it to feel like. Mm -hmm. And just kind of say, you know, it's like, what do you guys think? like yeah it's not very good you know like you know head heads heads down staring you know staring at the floor what do you guys think well the answer is you know uh, it's not it's not very good is it it's like no we've got to do better what can i and so then it's like okay what can i do to help you you know it's like mm -hmm. am i doing something am i doing something wrong can i do something better what's mm -hmm. what's not working for you um it's not really productive to tell someone they suck I have had I have had arguments with 
you know, the alpha in the band, which typically bands are typically the lead singer that, you know, they bossing everybody around, um, you know, trying to do a, a, a guitar overdub and, you know, getting on the talk back and trying to figure out what's not, what's not happy yet and trying to be encouraging, but be giving advice and direction. And then you've got this other voice kind of, uh, dim, you know, sort of beating them down and saying, well, I thought you were ready, man. I thought you had a part, you know, I was just like, what's your deal? You know, all that kind of stuff. I was like a situation where I kind of flew off the handle and, and blew up at uh, somebody because it's like, you are not, help- you're pissing me off. You're not helping. You're making them feel like shit. So is that the way you want to lead by, you know, don't you want to lead by example and by lifting them up and helping them figure that figure it out if you want a great performance out of the person you need to help, help me figure out how to make them feel great not make them feel like shit right. so you know it's like come on it's just like use your head here mm-hmm. um but uh yeah and then what was the, the first part well, was dealing with stress yeah oh i don't know uh well, you're pretty much wake and bake and then just stoned all day, right? So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> not exactly. Um, not exactly. But you got to blow off steam and you got to you got to know when it's time to get away. You know, mm-hmm. you've got to and you I mean, I I exercise, I do I do things away from the studio. I try to have balance in my life to to get rid of the stress and if something feels stressful in the studio, if at all possible just, you know, I deal with it with communication. And then, mm. you know, I even still feel anxiety, like anxiety at times about what's going on because the creative process is, you know, it feels very tenuous at times. And we, we're we not always clear or at our best, you know, it's like you wake up on the wrong side of the bed one day and you just, you come in and it's just like, oh gosh, this sounds like crap today. It's like, and sometimes it's just because chemically we're different and we're just hearing things different. It's like what we ate last night is, isn't really agreeing with us. And it's just like, so you have to sort of say like, okay, this sounded good when I, it sounded good for the first two days. And today I feel really uh, at, ill at ease with it, but you know, it's just like, just take a deep breath, maybe, maybe get off of it and work on something else, or just like, just stay the course, stay calm. It's just like, you felt really good about it before and I bet it'll come back and not, not get second guess it. Um, this job it involves a lot of psychology and you need to, you know, as much as you need to be good about talking to your client and communicating with your client, you need to understand yourself and, um, and, you know, and know when you might, maybe you're going to get a little spun out or over anxious or stressed out and d- deal with it Yeah, and deal with it in some way, let, let it go. Um, in some way, get rid of it somehow, you know, have a drink, have a smoke, have a run, have a swim, take a bath, you know, mm-hmm. call your mom, whatever, just change your, change your mindset and, 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 you know, live to fight another day. Yeah. Yeah. It's really good. Uh, Fab likes to say that a lot too. He's always like, you know, this player with this microphone, with this preamp and what you had for breakfast. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So it's a good one. Um, okay, so next one um, is, uh, hey, Jakir, I really enjoy the way you let a mix breathe by not overloading it with different elements. You also have done a fantastic job with Nora's voice. She's a wonderful singer with a beautiful voice, and it's also a very soft voice. How do you make a very soft voice pop through a mix, especially if it's a busy mix or a powerful chorus? Um, well, distortion is usually involved. Um, you know, a little, little thread of distortion on Nora's on Nora's album. I recorded with a second mic. I used a copper phone because it's a very it's a very small and pointed sound. Um, you know, and I had that uh, to blend in a little bit. And sometimes I would also use that individual. Tr- I didn't you know a lot of times, you know, I, I try to be very bold. And like when I get a sound, if it's a combination of mics, I print it to one track. Well, you don't want to do that with Nora Jones's voice, I can assure you. Um, and uh, so I would, I had the copper phone as a separate track. I put a ton of compression on it because it is like it's so frequency limited uh, that mm. it, like the the dynamic of what it records, the frequencies that it grabs across the tonality shifts in someone's voice, 
it can be really extreme. So I was just punishing it with compression to kind of get it reined in to where I could to sneak it in there and balance it a little bit. And it would kind of give me that, that uh, pointed texture that would kind of mm-hmm. help a soft voice cut through. And um, sometimes I would use that as a discrete uh, track for some of the effects. Like I would maybe mm-hmm. only send the copper phone mic to the, a delay. Wow, you know, just because yeah. then it kind of creates a little bit of interesting texture. You got this really <laughs> frequency limited um, source that you're creating delays with for this full frequency, beautiful primary vocal vocal sound. Mm. Um, you know, she it was uh, we primarily used uh, an Elam 250, not a 251, a 250, um, a Neve Pre, and um, <laughs> I guess an LA 2A. Very very sort of traditional great recording path mm. um and yeah. and she's a f- absolutely phenomenal singer i right. mean most things were a f- handful of takes and and often it was like nora i really love take three what do you think it's like yeah me too okay cool do you think we could use verse two from the f- second take yeah if you think so great <laughs> i mean <laughs> right really, you know, it's not, it wasn't like a bunch of crazy comping with her or tons of singing. You know, I've just, I've, I have had the good fortune on a, a few occasions to just have vocalists that could really deliver. But to answer the question, uh, if you don't have a second record path, um, like a real, real frequency limited uh, uh, duplicate of your main vocal track, um, put a little bit of saturation distortion on it and kind of sneak it in there because it's really hard to have a, f- a big full frequency, soft, you know, sounding voice and be able to directly influence it to have that sort of yeah. a way to cut through. So you do it. It's like that parallel compression thing. You know, it's like, exactly. if you want, if you want a sound to be a component of it, but it would, it would be a detriment to the whole thing, you know, do it in parallel. Do it is something you can blend in. And then, you know, sometimes, you know, maybe this a section of a song you kind you can kind of lean on even more or or switch to it entirely. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, just kind of you have these it gives you an opportunity. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah. It looks like you're gonna say yeah, something. Yeah, no, you're- I exactly the same thing. I was just gonna point out the what you just said is that for anyone listening, they think like, oh well, the thing I'm working on is only recorded on one mic. Well, just make the second microphone. Mm-hmm. Filter it, compress mm-hmm. the hell out of it, saturate it, and then start blending it in. And now you've made the extra mic. And the big deal about it is that it has a different dynamic shape. So generally it will have less dynamics than the main vocal which means it's going to be a consistent addition to the vocal no matter what happens. So when the singer really starts going for it, the uncompressed vocal is going to completely take over and you aren't all of a sudden adding tons of distortion. It's not on a send from the main vocal. You just make this thing and it's a little package and then you blend it in. And it works great. I mean, that's I do that all the time. I ride it or do mute automation, like only use it in the chorus or whatever. Yeah. Do you do... Question for you, Andrew. I mean, uh, and uh, lots of mix engineers do this. I don't partic- particularly. I'm just curious what you, if you do it, is like where you have all your favorite vocal compressors. Like on the day, like you you run the vocal through like six com- your six favorite vocal compressor paths, and then you mix. You know, you you pick the one you like the best, and maybe blend in one of the other two. No, you know? that I probably should. Because lots of people uh, do not it, my but style it either. just feels like no. I've always got the vocal track, and then I treat that for the song, whatever it is. And most of the time, it isn't compressed, but sometimes it is, or whatever. Then I've always got two different parallel chains that are in my template that are there. Mm-hmm. One of them is that Poltec LA two A Poltec thing, which is basically just smashed up mid range thing, and then another is eleven seventy six with all the buttons in. So that's like an aggression thing. And okay. then it's just different ones of those come in and out. And usually with those three things, because the main vocal is what feeds that 1176, but the pull tech one is completely on its own. It's not part of that parallel mm-hmm, thing. Mm-hmm. It's earlier. Between those three, that's usually all I need. 
because once I make the lead vocal into kind of the core of it, it feeds off into the other two, and then that's they sort of always give me what I need based on what I've made out of the main one. But sure. yeah, well, obviously I'm, I'm, there are other people right there. with the six. I'm right there with you. I do pretty much a, a very similar thing. It's uh, different a bit, but yeah, but yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, there's to all that to say there, there, are, there are different ways to achieve this. You know, it's just like, yeah. some, so, you know, some mixers have their six favorite vocal treatment paths and they just feed the vocal to all of them, pick, pick the one that should lead uh, or, you know, and then, and go from there. Yeah. And this, you know, our, our, our what we do, Andrew, is, a, is sort of, is a, ver, is a smaller sort of version of that where we don't have, you know, don't have as, have as much, and we're not blending together a bunch of different things um it's interesting so you don't put that much compression on your tr your tr primary track for vocal no usually not um but that said sometimes even on a really dynamic um clean vocal there'll be an 1176 with all buttons in on the main vocal track just not compressing that hard but it's that's more of a character thing Mm -hmm. and less of a dynamics control thing for me because the parallel stuff is what does all the dynamic control i guess mm -hmm. um but also and yeah and things just change i mean you were talking about it as well like at, until recently i was always using tons of parallel compression on everything and a compressor on the mix bus mm -hmm. and now there is no compressor on the mix bus and the vca that controls all my parallel stuff is sitting at like minus 20 when it used to be at zero so i don't know what the hell is going on but are your mixes are your mixes getting quieter a little bit not much okay. which you'd think they'd get a lot quieter but uh <laughs> they are i know they're definitely quieter but they're more they're more open it's just you know like if you say this sort of uh like this the back bus the rear bus parallel compression where lots of stuff mm. is going into it there mm. are some amazing benefits to it and there's some amazing horrible things that come with it and Absolutely. you just go in phases as to whether you like the good stuff more than you hate the bad stuff. And at the moment, I fucking hate the bad stuff. Right, right, right. So. It's interesting. I, I personally have been mixing in, in Luna a lot. And because it has such an analog, you know, sound and feel to it, I'm actually, because of all the tape emulation that, that's built yeah. in and, the, and all that stuff, I'm using less compression now, you know, right. and, and, and having, having to do less of that stuff, I guess I'm a little tired of some of the bad stuff too. And I, I am, I seem to be gravitating back to, towards something that's a little bit more open and dynamic and less smashed together. Yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah. And I think like I'm doing what you're getting out of Luna, I'm doing because they're omni channels all over the place and most of them it's just a saturation knob but it's mm. not everything everything's mm -hmm. getting a little bit of that which gives it more harmonic content for things to grab onto things are a little bit easier to hear but it also does a little bit of dynamic control on each track individually so totally. i don't need to do it that's another else. thing that i love about the omni channel in terms of like putting it on a bus for something is that you know there was there was a project I was mixing re recently, and I used the Omni channel on the mix on the on the, excuse me on the vocal bus, because I it did need just a little bit of extra grit, and you just you know I mean through the saturation on I may have turned it up to like one and a half I mean it was barely on but it gave me just enough of that you know the thing that I needed and and uh, and sometimes I like to have um, I mean I'll do individual compression on the vocal. Uh, sometimes some of the parallel stuff we just talked about, but then I want just one more little step of glue on it, you know, and yeah. then so I can use the I can use that compression, you know, in 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 the omni channel and just kind of like blend, you know, blend it in as a cor you know accordingly, as opposed to making yet another parallel path. Right, right, so, yeah, which just you know. keeps the session more manageable and yeah. Easy and the to other thing about the omni channel on the on a vocal bus is that uh, you know the way that you you guys put that de-essers together. Yeah. You know, I had a, I had a pretty pro problematic uh, vocal the other day where um, a, like I would say 80% of the vocal was recorded on one mic and then we had to punch stuff and we, that mic wasn't available. So we had to, so, so I have stuff on two different channels um, uh, to EQ them, to make them sound the same. So to go through the bus, but, the, but to EQ them the same, to get them to, to sound the same, I was getting in a little bit of trouble with the S's. And so, you know, 
being able to have the two DSers, you know, I was, I was doing the primary DSing like around four or five K, but every once in a while, you know, the real, the stuff way up there would get a little out of control. And I was able to use that second DSer as a little bit of a, a like a high frequency shelf to, right. to knock it down, you know? So it's like, it's just, it's a really great tool. Um, and, you know, that, and another project that I used it on, there was so much sound baked into the, the production that I didn't really need to do a lot of individual like treatment. It kind of, it was already, I just had to balance it and then just, you know, it's like, okay, well, you know, it's like put the Omni channel on there. Cause I can do almost everything I need to do in one place, one place. And that's good to go, you know, but you know, another, but another good, care. another good, um, <laughs> another good plugin. I don't know if you've checked this out. It's uh, PSP makes, um, a channel strip that's just it's pretty new that sounds really really great too cool it's, no i haven't used that yet yeah it's um what is it now i, I got omni channel stuck in my brain but psp makes a a channel strip that's infinite strip maybe huh yeah. infinite Infini strip, strip that's right yeah infinite strip yeah, yeah that's it yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. it's amazing cool. amazing Excellent. nice one awesome. uh let's keep going another one more question cool. i think we might that might have to do it all right yeah one, cool the uh i think that you I'll just see if quickly you want to add anything to this, but the next most upvoted question was from Chris Mataran and he uh, just said, Hey, Jakir, could you please talk about um, how you're planning on replacing pro tools with Luna and the reason why? Um, I think you just touched on it a little bit, but, uh, and then I have a question about your start to finish series. So, okay. Choose um, what you want to hit. Luna, um, you know, it's just like, I have always, you know, pro tools has a sound that I, you know, I felt like we've always had to work very hard to get things to sound analog and glued together the way we want to have, like the way that, you know, the way that things sounded when I started in the studio is not the way Pro Tools sounds by default. You have to do an awful lot of work to get it to do that, to do that thing. And, you know, Luna is uh, sonically a step it's just an improvement. It's just, it gives me a lot of the thing. It gives me a lot of the detail and the depth and the space, uh, that, that I, that I want to, you know, have in a production without having to do a bunch of heavy lifting and grinding and create all these parallel paths and create all this extra distortion and so forth and so on, because, because it's a, it's a fine line where you kind of, you're, you're kind of walking the line between doing enough, but then not, you know, and not overdoing it. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, uh, you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm ready to have a, a system that's, a, you know, Pro Tools is amazing. Don't get me wrong. It's, it, it is the industry standard. It has given us pretty much so much of the workflow that we have now, but it's a 30 year old program that, you know, there's some things built into it. And I'm, I'm excited about um, the opportunity to use a new platform that kind of is a, that looks at what some of the best aspects of um, all the DAWs are out there. It has an analog sound. It, and, you know, I think people are going to be trying to play catch up here real soon, but the, the, the near zero latency record paths, the unison technology, I mean, it's this, it's the studio of the future for, for the majority of people. And, um, and I'm interested to, um, to know how to use it. And, and I, and I have the good fortune to be involved in the sort of uh, you know, development and comment on it and, and help along that, you know, so I'm doing it selfishly as well to kind of get a system that I want to move on to. I am, I'm, I'm, I am ready to move on from Pro Tools. So. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Uh, next one is from Brian G and, uh, this will be our last question for everybody. Um, so, you know, so if, uh, guys, if you didn't get your questions answered, hold on to them. Yeah, there's Sounds part like two. And also once we let Jakir yeah. go, don't everybody right, run away. Cause there's a little bit of housekeeping afterwards. Cool. Okay. Uh, so last question for you, Jakir from Brian G. I've been watching your recent start to finish series on Pyramix, and I really loved your approach to editing drums and bass to get them more in time with the track. Could you talk about how you might approach this process in different scenarios where the band may not have recorded to a click track or where you may need to do more precise edits? Thanks. Okay. Um, well, I mean, if they haven't played to a click track, it's really just about, you know, the ebb and flow of it, you know, uh, 
it's like if you haven't recorded a click track and you feel like you've got a good take, well, then I would, you know, most of it should be pretty solid and you're not really having to do much um, other than move a few moments here or there and just kind of do it by feel and by ear and, and kind of looking at, you know, if something goes by and it feels good and then you get to another spot, it's like well, something doesn't feel right, you know. It's like, well, where I feel like I need to move this snare drum or I need to move this bass note. It's just like sometimes you can just kind of go back and look at like, well, where it felt good, like what's this relationship? And then try to, you know, and then kind of use that relationship as a relative way to to adjust the the other section. Um, more precisely, uh, I guess that means like more on the grid. I don't know. What is it? I'm not sure what that means. Yeah, if you had to do more precise edits, maybe... Um... Yeah, actually, for anybody who hasn't seen the start to finish, you you kind of are shifting things around in larger chunks. So you're not just saying like, "Let me slice out my yeah. snare and put that on the grid." You're you're kind of like moving uh, bars. Yeah, I mean, it's cases. a perform. I'm trying to preserve the perform. I'm trying to preserve a performance. So I think the things. I mean, the things in a drum kit. If we just take a drum kit and and you're trying to match it to uh, a grid or an, an, an another real, rhythmic element like a loop or some programming or you know whatever. Um, you know, the things that are going to flam the most or the things that are going to sound the most uh, unhappy are kicks and, you know, kicks and snares, the big, like the big punchy rhythmic timekeepers, all the in-between stuff um, doesn't matter as much because it, it's in between rhythms. And that's where the, that's where a lot of the feel of the performance is. So, you know, um, so I try to grab things in as big as big a chunks as makes sense. It, and it also depends on the player. I mean, some, some play some players are you know they they when they make a mis now i wouldn't call it a mistake but if like if the snare drum's late you know they don't let that upset their they don't upset their greater rhythm and they right. and they the next thing that they do is right back on time they don't let it upset them some people kind of realize that they hit the snare late and they think about it for a bar or two and they kind of mm. they you know, they compensate. Sometimes they start playing a little bit ahead to kind of then find the spot again where things are grooving. Um, so you just kind of have to look at it and adjust things accordingly. I think if you mean more precise, I don't, I think it's a bad idea to like cut every event up and place it somewhere because then it's not a performance anymore. You've taken all of the feel out of it. So, you know, in, in the, for those of you that haven't seen the, the Pure Mix start to finish where I'm doing the editing. I don't get in, I don't get in too close. You know, I'm, I'm zoomed out just enough so I can, I can kind of see a little bit of the landscape of what's going on. And I, I cut things, um, it, you know, it's, it's a learned skill at this point, but I, and I cut, I cut things, you know, where I think that I want them. If I want something to be slightly behind the grid, well, then I'll, I'll leave a little bit of space before the transient starts. And then when I when I snap that to the grid, it's actually happening behind the grid. Or if I if it needs to be on top, I'll cut off, I'll cut at the transient, quantize that to the grid, and then drag out the front of it so you hear the full sound. It just it just depends on mm -hmm. how you want the groove to fit. I think it's a bad idea to just kind of like blanket put things on the grid because that's not there's no feel involved in that. And it really is listening, even even though you observed me. Um, using the grid as a visual reference, it's mostly about I'm listening first yeah. and addressing the things that catch my ear. Um, and, you know, I might take a second, listen to something that doesn't look good, but if my ear tells me that it's good, then it is good. And because it's not, because everything's moving around, it's a performance, it's a relationship. And so maybe there's Maybe there's something else going on in the instrumentation and uh, in, in a part that is meant to be behind at that moment, and and the drums being its partner and friend and support being a little bit late is the way that 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 feels correct. So it's always a job of um, of listening first and just using the visual stuff as confirmation and. Um, yeah, I mean all the in between stuff, the hi hats, the the ride symbol, the shaker, you know, you know, the tom tom, whatever it is in between. I'll move, I'll move the I'll move the kick drum. Like let's say I'm moving a kick drum. I'll move the kick drum to be where it needs to be, and I'll you know I was like, well, did if I pull the stuff that's that's played after it, 
forward with it, does that feel good? Or should I just leave that where it was? And then I just sort of stretch it over from where the snare drum was. Um, I, I hope that makes sense. I just, I try to leave it is, is in it intact as much as possible because mm -hmm. that's not, that's not really, the job should not be, um, I think, you know, somebody was in my studio the other day and they commented and I was a little bit sad about it, honestly. They commented that they're glad that they don't, they're not, they're making records now and not back in the old days. And I was like, well, it's because, you, you know, maybe, maybe you should think about working a little bit harder or, or it's like, mm. it's not just about like, you know, it's just not just about playing the notes or singing the words off a page. It's like, you got to get to a performance and that's, right. that's good recording. That's how you get, that's how, that's how a recording becomes special and you bake in all those, those, that magic is that it's, it's an interaction. And so you can't, you can't screw around with that too much. Right. Um, so it's a, it's a, del it's a delicate thing. It's all about listening. If it sounds good and feels good, it doesn't matter what it looks like. Yeah. And listen in context too. If you've soloed up the drums and something sounds weird, that doesn't mean there's anything weird with the drums. It, no, it's all no. about the context. And also, I think sometimes people forget you can edit the programming. If they played to programming, but the track feels right. great, edit the programming. Right. And you can do that to a grid that you make from the drums. Like their tools and Pro Tools, you can do a live tempo map off the drums and chop that shit. You don't have to spend a lot of time on it just to hear it. Yeah. Like what if you hard grid all the programming to the kick and the snare? Right. If that takes you more than half an hour, it's because you don't know how to use the tools that are there. So, yeah, but the context is it. Because, man, I was on a couple of, I got the f great fortune to record Mr. James Gadsden on a session. And mm. we were, did the take, take felt great. Like, okay, cool, that's the take. And then we were double checking something. So we went back and sold up the drums. It was just about the bleed. Like, our, how much of the bass amp are we hearing? Because we think we might want to change the bass part. And this drum fill went by. And we're like, what the fuck just happened? It sounded like he fell over. Like, it was so out of time with what was going on. So like, hold on, rolled back, unsoloed, listened back, and it was one of the best feeling things I'd ever heard in my life. <laughs> right. It made you laugh out loud when you heard it in context, but you were sure that you needed to re-record it when you heard it on its own. That's yeah. such an important part. I mean, I don't, I don't edit drums, I mean, yeah. You, ha you have to edit things and you have to listen in context. Now, obviously, you know, if, if you've got a scratch vocal, yeah, maybe turn that off or maybe if there's extra guitar parts, you know, ha have enough information in there so you know you, ha you have context. Maybe you mute some things and kind of rebalance or just turn some things down to, to bring the thing that you're editing a little bit more into focus. But yeah, it yeah. really is about context. It's, mm -hmm. I mean, before we had all this capability, you know, there was a lot of music and I would say the most of the music that influences our taste and execution of records now was recorded before we had the ability to do the things we have now. And yeah. so, but I it mean, doesn't mean that people didn't work at it either. And it's not like no. all those musicians were superhuman. I mean, you know, go mm -hmm. read everything you can find about how they made the black album and edited all those drums together and like it's there's it's always been hard work now just we get to do some of the stuff in a little bit easier mm -hmm. that's all absolutely absolutely yeah. um on that note the uh, uh one of my favorite like feeling things uh that i can think of in like the last 10 years was uh a record that i believe you both worked on uh which was kaleo right am i saying that right kaleo, kaleo. yeah 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 kaleo, kaleo, yeah. yeah um so no good that song has a moment in there where it just feels like you're like pushed into this black hole and all of time and space bends or whatever it's just <laughs> like this one fill that's that's the emotion that i had the first time i heard it and i was like the feel of that was insane um was that song completely off a click no it's uh, it's no it was done to a click and there's a lot of programming in there yeah. um mm -hmm. but we it has a tempo map I mean, the temp, there's tempo shifts in it. And so there was a lot of effort put, put into playing it in, you know, in pre-production and note, making notes and then getting to the studio and you know, getting, 
getting each, you know, figuring out how each section was supposed to sort of feel and where the tempo shifts were and mapping that out. So it took a bit of effort to kind of map all that out. Um, mm -hmm. And then we, you know, we, we got the take or takes, I forget if it was multiple takes. I think, I think that's multiple takes that are kind of cut together in sections. Mm -hmm. um, little bit of editing, certainly. And then uh, the intro was cut independently of the, okay. of the song. Uh, so we so we we finished the basic track of the song after we got the tempo map and got it all organized and then we cut the intro completely separate the band playing not to a click they just played that free of time mm. and then once we had an intro that we liked then we just placed it at the front of the song in a way that sort of made sense to the to the flow of things um and so yeah on the kaleo record we spent a lot of time working out the tempo shifts and tempo maps. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think, yeah, well, there was a song on there. Um, gosh, there was one song on there where we did, we did do what Andrew has mentioned where we took a performance and we made a grid based off of the performance to then, uh, you know, correct the programming to, or line the mm -hmm. programming up with. Right. And then, yeah, I had the, uh, it was awesome that uh, I was able to to produce that record, and then uh, Andrew did a fantastic job mixing it. And that that song, yeah. that song was like kind of for me, was one of the things that th that they really wanted to to achieve at kind of at a high level is to be have this really modern, heavy hitting, sort of bluesy rock song. Mm -hmm. um that you know just 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 came on and hit like a modern modern record with but with a you know it's kind of a vintage style or like a throwback style of kind of rock um yeah, yeah and andrew killed it yeah it was awesome yeah wow, it was yeah the whole thing great fun i mean and, and jj is definitely one of the most sensitive people to feel and balance and stuff that i've ever worked with i mean hmm he'll work you to death on stuff but it's because it's not right and he's hearing something and when you get there it's like okay you, you get it and so definitely with the feel on that stuff it's mm -hmm. got to be it's musical it's all about being musical yeah there was a, i don't um uh i forget what song it is but there's it took us all day literally all day to like map it out and record it um because it's got like five tempo shifts in it um mm -hmm which so oh well that uh gosh i wish i could remember the song but what we had to do is we had to establish what the tempo was for each section of the song but jj was just could not but we couldn't we couldn't decide on how how to properly get from one tempo shift to the other because there was these big stops and mm -hmm. it was just like the music would stop and then it'd just be we just have to feel the amount of time that needed to happen so once we got all the sections mapped out in um what the tempos should be we you know we the band would start you know they'd play the whole song but it would be like okay well we have we have a count in for this section you guys play the section and then you do the stop and it just hangs and it would hang for like 20 seconds and then and then the, then the new tempo would count them in and then they'd play the next section mm. and then so forth and so on and then once we had all the pieces then we'd then we sort of shrunk that in between time down to where it's like, yeah, that's it. That's, that's, mm. that's where I want to feel it, you know, and that's totally dictated by JJ's desire to have these moments that weren't necessarily measured in the rhythm that preceded or was about to follow. It just is like, it's just like, you just want to feel the space and now, you know, kind of mm -hmm. thing. It was, it was, it was hard work and it was interesting, but the result feels completely natural and feels yeah. like it was not played to a click and it was not a constructed thing when indeed yeah. it it was very very intensive uh process to get there right. yeah yeah no good is is all of those things for me and yeah the the section that i'm thinking of it's it's almost like there's a bar of five or something in there and then it yeah but it, oh, that, it very that much does feels that now. does happen some yeah. that does happen sometimes yeah where you mm -hmm. have a yeah, just need, you know, you're on a click, but you just need that extra breath of time so you make a bar of five. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, totally. yeah. Awesome. Well, totally. yeah, thank you both for making that one. Yeah, yeah that's great. <laughs> Excellent. Cool. Shakira. Oh, I can't go on without you, I think, is the song. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. 
I think so. Well, I look forward to part two. I'm sorry I have to go. No, man. This is this has been great and we'll be fresh for part two. It'll be good. Perfect. It'll Perfect. be excellent. So I'm sorry for sorry everybody I didn't answer your questions. But we'll yeah, hold them for time. part two, everybody. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Copy them out of the chat. Ask them again next time. Yep. So Got him. yeah, so we'll be picking up in what, ninety, nineteen ninety seven or something like that. Thereabouts, yes. Yeah. Perfect. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much, Chakir. Thank so you, you can Thank split you whenever you need to, but I'm just going to mm -hmm. tell the kids what are what's coming up. I'm going to listen to a little house cleaning while I make a text, and then I do have. Okay. To go. Um, so okay. next week is your good neighbor and friend, um, and you do you do quite a good impression of him as well, Mr. Vance Powell. <laughs> <laughs> so that should be absolutely epic. And I have um, because I panic when I don't have guests booked up. I kind of went nuts over the last week, and we're now booked until the end of April. And some amazing people coming. So I'll tell you about that as we go. But there's one very specific thing that is coming up on March 15th, which I'm going to talk about every week until it happens. We're doing a panel discussion on hearing health, on tinnitus, hearing loss, with some people who are way smarter than me. So it's going to be me. Chad Blake has agreed to do it. Susan Rogers is going to come back in her role as one of the smartest people on the planet and author Bella Bathurst, who is an amazing author uh, who lost her hearing for 12 years and then got it back. And she wrote a book about her her journey through that. So it should be really good. There are a couple other people I'm trying to get to just come on and talk about stuff. See you, Jakir. See Bye. you really soon, man. Bye, Jakir. See you. Um, so that's going to be really important and really good. And please have your questions. We're not going to talk about compression. I don't care what you ask. We're not talking about prints. <laughs> We're not talking about anything Chad's done making records. We're talking about your ears and hearing and the difference between listening and hearing, because those are two very different processes. And I think it, it'll be really fun, but also really, really important. That's what I have to say about that. Awesome. Now, the other thing is you may have noticed you may have noticed me drinking out of this mug, which I received today in a package. Um, there's swag with my ugly face on it, but it's a really good mug. It's big. Um, <laughs> Gu uh, Guillaume and, and Fab wanted me to also wear the beanie and the t-shirt, which I'm not going to do on air because that would be a little <laughs> creepy. But uh, the beanie's quite comfortable, I have to say. It's very stretchy. So Nice. Yes. That means I'm probably going to get an email that I have to do it. Yeah, exactly. My... <laughs> exactly. But I, I would highly recommend this mug. It's good mm. circumference, nice, you know, nice arc in the mouth. Anyway. Nice. 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 That's it. <laughs> good contact. That's Amazing. all I got to say, man. On my side, uh, if you're watching on YouTube, make sure you like and subscribe. It helps us keep the show going uh, yes. and, and bring more content to the channel. So please do that. Yep. Uh, and Friday, we have another episode with Jakir start to finish. Um, uh, it's going to be all of the uh, remainder of any vocal tuning that's going on in, in the session. So uh, make sure you tune in for that. If you're trying to get better at Melodyne, there's a bunch of tips and tricks in it. So it's a really good one. A really quick thing with Melodyne that I'd completely forgotten about. And I was talking to a friend of mine and he's like, well, why don't you just program the shortcuts for the tools? And mm. I'm like, oh, right. I right. completely forgot right. you could do that. <laughs> Put yeah. the, the three pitch tools on Q, W, and E and keep your left hand over that and you'll save an hour every time you yeah. do a vocal. Like why? Yeah. For years I haven't been doing that. <laughs> Same, same here. Yeah, I just we we just uh, filmed something with Vance Powell and um, his assistant Mike Fahey is an absolute wizard in Melodyne. It's just insane to watch him. And I was yeah, same thing. It was like last week. I was just watching him go, and I was just like, "What do you have going on?" He's like, "Programmed shortcuts or whatever." Yeah, it's and crazy. it's all so, built into Melodyne. Yeah. And I think very early on in Melodyne's history whether Pro Tools was gonna get the keystroke or Melodyne was gonna get the keystroke was always a little unclear, so I stayed away from mm. this stuff. Um, but right. yeah, amazing. And also, in case anyone noticed, I got a rack for my modular. I'm very you excited. You have questions in the chat room about Did this. It? Well, okay, let me, let me just explain. Yeah. We don't often talk afterwards, but we're gonna talk for a minute. Yeah. So <laughs> this is the first piece of custom furniture I have ever had for my studios, ever in my entire life. I'm terrified of getting it because I think like, well, but then what if I don't have that gear? But <laughs> I finally had a rack built 
for the modular. I just slammed all the modules in and I'm going to start rearranging. So maybe next week we'll even power them up and watch them blink. Uh, amazing. <laughs> I'm really, really excited cool. about that because we're just um, starting the sort of final phase of a low roar record and the modular gets used quite a bit on those records. Nice. And I did not want to be standing up in front of a rack. And so, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Super oh, that's exciting. Great. Uh, maybe on um, one of the episodes, sometimes we can like hook up your phone and you could give us a little tour or something. So. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I could yeah. zoom in and do that. Right now it's a mess. Yeah. There's there's some other stuff that may be going on. So it might be a couple of months before we do that because there's some other things that might mm -hmm. be changing drastically. Like there may be way more speakers in this room and I'll let you guys figure out what that might yes. be about. So I'm looking awesome. forward to being able to announce that. But it's, um, yeah. So, Yeah like that so you could do a atmos and atmosphere episode <laughs> you could do music provided by the modular yeah exactly exactly Perfect. that that wouldn't be annoying at all to have drones right. playing while i did an interview <laughs> while you try to explain atmos yeah yeah i think Perfect. that'd be great that'd be great yeah. so anyway vance powell next week um but definitely mark down march 15th and be here for this hearing thing because i think it's really important i think there is a stigma in especially in our community about admitting that your hearing isn't perfect and i think that the idea on march 15th is first of all we will prove that that's not the case and it's not important but also explain why having perfect hearing has nothing to do with being good at doing what we do yeah. it's a part of it but it's yeah really important to separate the physiological part from the neurological part totally different yeah. sides of the coin anyway blah 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 awesome okay so now is when i mute the mic and go to the thanks for watching screen because that's what we Great. do right <laughs> so <laughs> thanks mark wave. see you next <laughs> week all right bye andrew bye